Dear students, welcome to this course of engineering mechanics. And first, we will discuss statics. So let us have an introduction to statics. So these are the contents of the introduction. First, we will see what is mechanics. Then we will study different fundamental concepts and then the different fundamental principles. Then we will see about a different type of system of units that you will see in your mechanical engineering problems. Then we will see how to solve the different problems and then about the accuracy numerical accuracy of the solution so let us start first let us see what is mechanics so as you can see mechanics is the science which describes and predicts the conditions of rest or motion of bodies under the action of forces. So if you are having some bodies that are under the application of different forces, then by using mechanics you can predict the conditions of rest or motion of the bodies by applying the laws of mechanics. Now you can classify the mechanics or different type of bodies as rigid bodies, mechanics, so in rigid bodies, we can have statics and dynamics. So whenever you are studying the bodies which are rigid, then you have to study statics. When your bodies are in rest, then you have to study statics. And if your bodies are moving under the action of forces, then you can call it a dynamics then you can have deformable bodies so some bodies deform under the action of forces so then you have to use different laws our syllabus is limited to only this part statics and dynamics and there are for then you have the fluids so for studying fluid you will have different subjects like fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics. So in mechanics, we are studying rigid bodies only. And rigid bodies can have two types of mechanics, statics, when your bodies are in rest, and dynamics, when your bodies are moving under the action of forces. Now, mechanics is an applied science. It is not an abstract or pure science, but does not have the empiricism found in other engineering sciences. <coughs> so, mechanics is the applied science, means it is based on certain laws of physics, laws of motion. Okay, and uh, mechanics is the foundation of most engineering sciences, especially in designing of machines, designing of equipments, designing of structures. Mechanics is used, so mechanics is the foundation of most engineering sciences and is an indispensable prerequisite to their study. 
so if you want to study different type of engineering courses and then you have to study mechanics because you will be applying the principles of mechanics everywhere whenever you are designing certain machines certain structure certain equipments for that you need the principles of mechanics you need to calculate the forces you need you need to predict the conditions of less conditions of motion now we will see about uh, different fundamental concepts that uh, you will encounter in your mechanics course so one such concept is the space so what is the space associated with the notion of the position of a point p given in terms of three coordinates measured from a reference point or origin so whenever you are uh, solving some mechanics problems then all the bodies they must be present somewhere and that somewhere is the space and uh, you can represent the bodies by the coordinates so there is some reference system suppose you may have your x y z and uh, the reference system has uh, origin and your bodies they may be represent by a position coordinate p and this is all this is the space okay then another very important fundamental concept is time so from the uh, time definition of an event requires specification of the time and position at which it is occurred so if you are studying a rigid body that is moving then you need to know that at a particular time whether it is moving whether it is fixed whether it is in the state of rest or in the state of motion and after the period of certain time what is the position of the body so you need to specify those things okay suppose initially your body is at rest it is having uh, velocity v is equals to 0 at time t is equals to t1 and after a certain time say t is equals to t2 it is possible that your uh, rigid body or the system of rigid body it is moving with a certain velocity say 2 meter per second then you also need to specify some direction also then another important fundamental concept is the mass so mass is used to characterize and compare bodies so certain bodies are lighter in weight they are having less mass and because of less mass the earth's gravitational attraction uh, attraction force is also less and uh, also if you are sliding your body then it is having a less frictional force if the mass of the body is higher then it is attracted by a larger force towards the earth and also the resistance force will also be higher and another important fundamental concept is the force so force represents the action of one body on another so how one body is having action on another body and a force is characterized by point of application magnitude and direction 
whenever you are talking about a force you need to specify these three things at which point your force is applied what is the magnitude of that force and what is the direction of that force only then you can know the effect of that force so if there is some body suppose this is your body and suppose you are applying a force then you are having a point of application then you have the magnitude so some time magnitude is represented by the length of the arrow and by this you can represent the direction of the force so in newtonian mechanics space time and mass are absolute concepts independent of each other so the space time and mass they do not depend on each other they are independent to each other while force is not independent of other three so force depend on space as well as time as well as mass so the force acting on a body is related to the mass of the body and the variation of its velocity with time now there are certain fundamental principles which you might have studied in your physics course so one such fundamental principle is the parallelogram law so if there are two vectors p and q and they are represented by two arrows so this is the direction and the length of the arrow will represent the magnitude so uh, suppose uh, if you represent the two vectors by the arms two two sides of the parallelogram and you complete the parallelogram and then this uh, diagonal of the parallelogram will represent the resultant of these two vectors so if p and q are the forces then this r is the resultant of p and q so if you are representing p and q separately or if you want to represent them in a combined form then you can represent by them by r then another principle is the principle of transmissibility so suppose as you can see this is your rigid body and you are applying a force at this point suppose you are pulling this body in this direction and if you draw a line passing through this force this is the line <clears throat> what principle of transmissibility says it says that along this line the line of application of the force if you change the point of application so here the point of application is this now suppose you have changed the application to this point but uh, all other things means the magnitude of the force direction of the force it is same then this will have the same effect on the body so the effect uh, produced by this force f and this force f dash will be the same so this is called as the principle of transmissibility <coughs> then other fundamental principles are the newton's laws of motion so these laws you also studied in your physics course so newton's first law what it says it says that if the resultant force on a particle is zero the particle will remain at rest or continue to move in a straight line okay so suppose this is the body okay suppose one force is applied here one force is applied here and one force 
so we are having three forces on this body this is your body now if the resultant of this for these three forces is zero and suppose your initially the body is at, uh, is at rest and if you apply three forces and the resultant of all these three forces are zero then according to first law this body will remain in rest because no net force is applied we applied three forces but the resultant of the three forces is zero and similarly if the body is moving with a constant velocity and then we have applied all these three forces and it will continue to move with the same velocity so this is the first law and then next newton's second law a particle will have an acceleration proportional to a non zero resultant applied force <clears throat> so now if the the resultant force they are not zero but they are having certain magnitude f okay then the acceleration of the particle because of this unbalanced force will be directly proportional to the acceleration and if you write in the form of equality then you can write as f is equals to m into a so a particle will have an acceleration proportional to a non zero resultant applied force so f is directly proportional to the acceleration and third is the newton's third law so it says there the forces of action and reaction between the two particles have the same magnitude and line of action with opposite sense so suppose if you are having say a wall and you have applied some force f so this force you have applied on the wall suppose you are punching the wall okay then you also feel uh, some pressure on your hand so what is this that force is applied by the wall on your hand and it will have the same magnitude but the direction of that force will be opposite magnitude will be the same and line of action will be the same so this is the newton's third law <clears throat> so these are the fundamental principles then another one is the newton's law of uh, gravitation this i just forgot so what it says two particles are attracted with equal and opposite forces so because of the gravitational force two particles suppose one particle is having a mass capital m another part uh, particle is having a mass small m then they are attracted towards each other by this force f which is equals to f g mm upon r square which where r is the distance between the particles and g is the gravitational constant now we will see the different system of units that you will be using in your mechanics course so you will be having units for length time mass and force okay three of the kinetic units referred to basic units may be defined arbitrarily that is you can define the unit of length then you can define the unit for time so for say length for meter for time you can define second for mass you can have kg okay the fourth unit <coughs> which is also called as a derived unit must have a definition compatible with the newton's second law so the unit for force you will find by the by using second law okay so 
according to the SI units or international system of units, the unit of length is meter, the unit of time is second, the unit of mass is kilogram. Then force, which is the derived quantity, the unit of force will be this kg meter per second square and uh, 1 kg meter per second square is also defined as the newton so 1 newton will be 1 kg meter per second square then you can have some other units also so in different countries sometimes different units are used for example, in US, sometimes they use width for this length, for time they use second and for force they use pound. So in, uh, in US, uh, they are treating this force as the basic quantity, then mass is the derived unit in that case and the unit of mass is slug, which is equals to one pound divided by one foot per second. Now we will see the method of problem solution, how you are going to solve your problems. So first uh, thing is the problem statement means you should know about your problem clearly. Okay, What is the dimensions? direction of forces if the forces are applied figure showing all the quantities okay then a specification of what is to be determined so all these things should be known clearly every data even if a single data is missing then it might create problems and you will not be able to solve your problem correctly. So first thing is the problem statement. Then second most important thing in mechanics is to make the free body diagrams. So generally whenever you are solving the problem in mechanics, it involves different bodies. So in free body diagram, what you have to do, you have to create separate diagrams for each of the bodies involved. So if you are having two bodies, then you have to make two free body diagrams. If you are having three bodies, then you have to make three free body diagrams with a clear indication of all forces acting on each body. So you have to make the free body diagram for every body and you have to indicate all the forces that also includes the interaction forces between two bodies. Okay. And uh, after you make the free body diagrams, next step is to apply the fundamental principles which we have just discussed in the previous slides. So these six fundamental principles are applied to express the conditions of rest or motion of each body. Then you will apply the rules of algebra to solve the equations for the unknown quantities. So some quantities are known to you while some quantities are unknown. So by applying the fundamental principles and rules of algebra, you will be obtaining unknown quantities and the last step is to check your solution so in this what you can do you can test for the errors in reasoning by verifying the units of the computed results then you can test for errors in computation by substituting given data and uh, computed results into previously unused equations and then the last step is you can always apply your experience and physical intuition 
to access whether a result seems reasonable. Okay. Suppose you are having three bodies uh, and one body you are having say four Newton force, another body you are having say five Newton force, and for a third body you are obtaining say 100 Newton force. So that may look unreasonable. Okay. So you can use your physical intuition and experience that whether the result seems correct or not. Now next is the numerical accuracy. The accuracy of a solution depends on two points. First one is the accuracy of the given data. Okay. So if the data which is given to you that data is not accurate that's all your solution will also be not that much accurate okay so you need to make sure that the whatever data you are having that data should be accurate and second is the accuracy of the computations performed so whatever computations you are doing you are using some calculators or some software so you should make sure that that computations are performed with accuracy the solution cannot be more accurate than the less accurate of these two okay so suppose you are having this data up to say two decimal one decimal place but the accuracy of your computation is up to two decimal place then your solution should be accurate to up to one decimal place only because your first data is up to only up to first decimal place accurate okay so the use of hand calculators and computers generally make accuracy of the computations much greater than the accuracy of the data and the solution accuracy is usually limited by the data accuracy so this for the second part you are using calculators computers excel sheets so on so this is generally very accurate so generally the accuracy of your solution is limited by the given data so as a general rule for engineering problems the data are seldom known with an accuracy greater than 0.2 percent so generally up to this 0.2 percent you know the data accurately therefore it is usually appropriate to record parameters beginning with one with four digits and with three digits in all other cases So suppose if it is not beginning with one, so it is beginning with four, then you should record in three digits, okay? And if beginning with one, then you should record four digits, okay? So these are the contents of this lecture first we will have a look to applications what are the applications of statics of particles then we will have the introduction <clears throat> then we will discuss the resultant of multiple forces acting on a particle so we will discuss the resultant of two forces then we will uh, study something about vectors like addition of vectors and resultant of several concurrent forces and then we will solve sample problems so these are some of the applications i am uh, showing you only one application so as you can see in the figure 
suppose this crane is hanging by these ropes. So in this slide, you can see the applications. So suppose this crane is hanging by these ropes. These four ropes are there. So by the principles which you will study in this. Now we will see the introduction. So the objective for the current chapter is to investigate the effects of forces on particles. So suppose if you are having some particles, single particle or a group of particles, then you can investigate the effects of different forces that will be acting on the particles. So first thing you will uh, understood in this chapter will be the effect of forces on particles. The next thing which you will learn in this lecture is the replacing multiple forces acting on a particle with a single equivalent or resultant force. So sometimes suppose this is the particle and some multiple forces are acting on the particle. Suppose these three forces are acting then you can replace all these three forces by a single resultant force which is having the same effect as the effect of all these three forces okay so this you will learn the next thing you will learn relations between forces acting on a particle that is in a state of equilibrium So suppose uh, this particle is in the state of equilibrium that is either it is or in the state of rest or this particle is say moving with some constant velocity okay so what is the relation between the forces suppose these two four, three forces are applied and these one two and three and this particle is in equilibrium then we can learn the relation between the forces what is the relation between 1 2 and 3 that you will learn okay <clears throat> now let us see the resultant of two forces so suppose this is the force so force x uh, action of uh, one body on another so this we have already uh, studied in previous chapter that if there are more than one bodies then action of one body on another is called as force okay and uh, a force is characterized by its point of application magnitude line of action and its uh, direction so this we have learned in the previous uh, lecture also so whenever uh, some force is applied to a body then you have to see where this force is applied the point of application of the force magnitude of the force line of action of the force and direction of the force now suppose we are having two forces p and q so this is the force p this is the force q so experimental evidence shows that combined effect of two forces may be represented by a single resultant force so from experiments also you can verify this thing that if there is a body and some multiple forces are acting on the body 
and if you apply a resultant force which is equivalent to the resultant of all the forces then the effect will remain same okay means the effect which is produced by p and q is the same as the effect which is produced by r okay and the resultant is equivalent to the diagonal of a parallelogram which contains the two forces in adjacent legs so this we have already uh, also discussed in the previous class let's suppose these are the two forces p and q so if you draw these forces as the two legs or two sides of this parallelogram then the resultant will be represented by the diagonal of this parallelogram this is also called as parallelogram law of vector addition and the fact uh, force is a vector quantity so this thing all of you knows force is a vector quantity that is now vectors so this you might have studied in your physics class also what is a vector so any quantity which possesses magnitude so let us now understand about vectors any quantity which possesses magnitude and direction so any physical quantity which is having both the things that is magnitude and direction and which we can add according to the parallelogram law so that is called as vector so the examples of vector are displacement velocities and acceleration and force and so on there are different vector quantities <clears throat> then there are some physical quantities which do not need any direction so they are called as scalar so they possess only magnitude and no direction direction is not important for them for example mass so we do not need any direction uh, to specify the mass similarly volume temperature etc so now how you can classify vectors so there are fixed or bound vectors so they have well defined points of application that cannot be changed without affecting an analysis so some vectors they have fixed and bound means so they have definite point of application and you cannot change the point of application if you change the point of application then the results will also change so that is called as fixed vectors so fixed vectors are those which we cannot change means they have to remain at a specific point then there are free vectors that can be freely moved in space without changing their effect on an analysis so free vectors are those vectors that you can move along the line of uh, action or, or or in a space you can also move in a space and uh, there will be no effect of those vectors in the analysis means if you move me move the free vector then the analysis will remain same because they are free vectors so they do not have any effect on analysis means you can change their position and the analysis will not change then third is the sliding vector so it may be applied anywhere along their line of action 
in the previous video we have discussed about the uh, so now we will see addition of vectors so first one is the trapezoid rule so that is same as the parallelogram law so if you draw the trapezium Uh, if you have uh, uh, two vectors on the two sides of this parallelogram, then the resultant will be the diagonal of the parallelogram. So this is also called as trapezoid rule. Then another rule is the triangle rule for vector addition. So in the triangle rule, what uh, uh, you will do? Suppose this is the first vector P. Then what you will you will do? You will put the this uh, bottom of the other vector at the tip of this. So you will start. I will suppose I will draw here. So suppose this is the first vector P. then you will start from the tip of this uh, the the next vector you will draw from the tip of this and suppose the vector is starting here and it is having this direction so this is q now the resultant will be the this, uh, when you close this triangle when you complete this triangle so resultant will be this okay and the direction will be opposite. Suppose you are moving this, this, then the direction of resultant will be from here. So the same thing is explained in this figure. So here the, we have taken Q first. So you can take any vector first. So here they have taken P first. In, and this is at the second number. In this B figure, Q is taken as the first, then P is, P is drawn and then this P plus Q. So it will remain same. You can also say that vector addition is commutative. And you can calculate the also by the law of cosines. So the if this is the P and Q, then you can calculate R by this. Means magnitude you can calculate by this. P square plus R, Q square minus. 2pq cos b uh, where this b is the angle between the vectors okay and uh, the relation between the angles is uh, by the law of sines that is sine a by q will be equals to sine b by r will be equals to sine c by a okay so suppose uh, q q is this so then sin a by q sin b by r and sin c by a and this thing we already know vector addition is commutative that means either you are adding p plus q or q plus p you will obtain the same answer means the resultant vector will be same as shown in these two figures a and b so either we are adding p plus q or q plus p we are getting the same vector means its direction is also same and its magnitude is also same and uh, then vector subtraction so vector subtraction is the uh, basically the addition of vector with a negative vector okay so suppose if you want to subtract p minus q then what you will do you will take p and you will take the negative of q means you will reverse the direction of q vector and the resultant will be p minus q
Now let us see the resultant of uh, several concurrent forces. So suppose uh, we are having a point A. So first we should know what are the concurrent forces. So if uh, all the forces they are passing through the same point, then uh, those forces they are called as concurrent forces. So because these forces P, Q and S, they are passing through the same point A. So all these forces, they are concurrent forces. And we can replace uh, all these forces by a single resultant force, which is the sum of which is the sum of the applied forces, vector sum of the applied forces. So you can replace these forces P, Q and S by a single force R. And this R is the sum of these forces and it will, it will have the same effect as all these forces will together have. So, how you can calculate the resultant? You simply draw one vector, then you draw second vector from the tip of first vector, then you draw third vector from the tip of the second vector, and then you simply close the polygon. Okay, so this is also called as polygon law of vector addition. Now, another very important thing is the vector force components. So because sometimes when you are solving the problems, so you have to divide the force into two components. So uh, suppose your force is acting in any arbitrary direction and you want to resolve the force into two um, directions, say X, Y and Z. So sometimes it's two direction when you are solving the problem in 2D. And sometimes you are solving the problem in 3D, then uh, you will resolve the force in X, Y and Z direction, all the three. So suppose this is your initial force F. So you can resolve in direction P. So this direction and denoted by as P and in this direction and denoted by as Q. So these two components P and Q, they will have the same effect as P. So this is just the reverse of uh, addition, you can say. So uh, when you add P and Q, then the F will have the same effect. Now you are dividing F into P and Q. So this is just reverse of the. Now we will solve a sample problem. So this problem contains a bolt and two forces. P of 40 Newton and Q of 60 Newton are acting on this bolt and the inclination of force P is 20 degree from horizontal while inclination of force Q is 25 degree from P. So we have to find the resultant of these two forces. Now what strategy you can adopt for the solution? So you can adopt a graphical solution strategy as well as you can solve by using the equations. So in graphical strategy, graphical solution, you can solve by drawing the parallel ground law in parallelogram law of vector addition you have to make the parallelogram by considering p and q as two sides and then you can make the diagonal which will represent the resultant of two forces p and q so this you can do in graphical technique another one method of graphical solution is the 
triangle rule so you can make the triangle and you can also use the law of sines and law of cosines so you can use any one of the method whichever you feel comfortable so this is the graphical uh, solution of the problem so what we have done so suppose this is the horizontal so we have drawn p and this angle will be 20 degree okay then you can take 25 degree and draw q and this length is suppose say 4 centimeter and this length is 6 so now you have drawn the two sides of the parallelogram now next step you can do draw a line parallel to this so this line this this line is parallel to this line ap and another line you will draw parallel to this so this is the uh, this line is parallel to this so in this way now your parallelogram is complete so now you can draw the diagonal this is the diagonal and uh, you can measure this angle alpha and you can measure this length this length so when you measure this length you will find this the length will be 9.8 if uh, you are you have drawn in the centimeter scale so then the answer will be 98 newton and this angle will be 35 degree yes no no this is the graphical uh, method we will discuss the theoretical method also okay similarly uh, when you draw the triangle triangle law so this is the triangle law solution so first you draw p so, so this angle is 20 degree then what you will do from the tip of this you will draw the second uh, vector and this inclination should be 45 degree okay because this 20 and 25 and next what you will do you will complete this triangle so again you will measure this uh, length and this angle when you will find there this will be length will be 9.8 so 98 newton and angle will be so this is the this method okay so law of cosine says that the resultant of two vectors will be p square plus q square and minus of 2 pq cos b where b is the angle between the two vectors okay so p is 40 newton you know q is 60 newton and this angle angle between uh, both the forces will be this this one so it is 55 degree 155 degree so if you solve this equation then you will find the answer as 97.73 okay so it is very near to 98 and uh, you also have to find this angle alpha so because this is only the magnitude you also need to find the direction so that you know the complete information regarding the solution so for that you can use law of science so law of science is this so sine a by q is equal to sine b by r okay 
So sine B, B is this. We have just calculated 155 degree. Okay. Then Q is 60 Newton. We already know this. And R, this we have just calculated 97.3. So from this equation, okay, you can calculate sine A. Sin A will be equals to sin B. We have taken this Q here. Okay. So uh, Q, Q by R into sin B. So sin B you can calculate. Q you know. R you have calculated. So simply solve this equation. And you will get A is equal to 15.04 degree. Means this angle. Uh, this angle is A, 15.04 and with horizontal you will simply add 20 degree. So alpha will be because alpha we will take from this horizontal direction. So we simply add this 20 plus A means alpha by so alpha will be 20 plus a means 35.04 degree. So we are getting almost the same solution by using this law of sines and law of cosines. It is possible uh, to resolve a force vector into perpendicular components. So suppose this is the force vector f. So we can resolve this vector into the components fx and fy in 2D and if you want to resolve in 3D then you can have fx, fy and fz. So you can write f as fx plus fy. Now to do this what we do we define unit vectors. So we have defined two unit vectors, i and j. i is the unit vector in x direction and j is the unit vector in y direction. So i is parallel to x, j is parallel to y. Similarly in 3D, z, we define z as parallel to z axis. So now if you want to resolve the force, you can do so by this method. F will be equals to Fx i plus Fyj, where Fx is the magnitude in the x direction. So this component is showing the magnitude Fx and i will show the direction. So Fx i means Fx in the x direction. Similarly, in the y direction, we have f, y, j. And these f, x and f, y are the scalar components of f. So they are the magnitudes and this will show the direction. So in this way, you can break any force or any vector, whether it is displacement vector, force vector or any other vector into the components. Now, if you want to add forces by summing x and y components, then this method is very simple. So suppose you are having three concurrent forces. What is concurrent force? When your all the forces, they are passing through the same point. So here P, Q and S, they are passing through same point A. So that is why they are called as concurrent forces. So for the addition of concurrent forces, you simply need to add the three, R is equal to P plus Q plus S. And uh, it is very easy. So suppose R is the resultant force. So for adding these three forces, what you have to do, you need to break the forces into the components and add the components in the same direction. 
So resultant will be Rx i plus Ryj while on the RHS you can have say this is the force P. So you need to break this into Px and Py. So Px i plus Pyj. Then similarly Q. You will break Q into Qx i and Q yj then s and what you will do you will combine the forces in the same direction that is in the x direction we will combine px plus qx plus sx and we will write them into the bracket then i now similarly py plus qy plus sy into j so this is how you can add the forces and the resultant force you can represent like this rx and ry so rx will be equals to px plus qx plus sx and ry will be equals to py plus qy plus sy and uh, the resultant magnitude r you can find like this so this is the components rx and ry in the x and y direction while r is the resultant so to find the resultant you simply square the components rx square plus ry square and take the square root of that that will give you the magnitude of the resultant force and simply take 10 inverse of ry and rx then you will get the direction of the resultant force with respect to horizontal direction so this is how you can add the forces for any vectors that are passing through a concurrent force point sorry concurrent point. So you, you simply break all the forces into the x and y components, add the x components together, add the y components together then you will get the components of the resultant force and by doing this you can simply take the you mean square the components and take the square root you will find the resultant and similarly by taking the tan inverse of r y and r x you can get the magnitude of the force so when the resultant of all forces that are acting on a particle is zero the particle is said to be in equilibrium. So when a particle is in equilibrium, that is if the resultant force on a particle is zero, then according to Newton's first law, the particle will remain at rest or will continue at constant speed in a straight line. So suppose if uh, this is the particle and uh, two forces are applied on this particle. So one for, uh, force is of 100 pound in this direction while another force is having the same magnitude that is 100 pound but it is in the opposite direction. So these forces are equal in magnitude and they have same line of action but opposite in sense means their direction is opposite. So when you calculate the resultant of this then obviously it will be zero. So we can say that this particle is in equilibrium because the resultant of the forces acting on this particle is zero. Now suppose if more than one forces are acting on the body so this is the body or particle a and there are two forces sorry four uh, four forces are acting f1 f2 f3 and f4 so now when you calculate the resultant of these four forces and if uh, the resultant is zero then this particle will be in equilibrium now the resultant can be calculated by using the graphical solution 
so when you will be using a graphical solution then suppose this is the f1 so suppose i have drawn the f1 like this and from tip of the f1 i have drawn f2 and from tip of the f2 i have drawn f3 like this and f4 like this so in case of uh, the particle in equilibrium the resultant should be zero that means all the forces that are acting on this particle uh, should be should form a closed polygon only then the resultant will be zero so if you use graphical method then if you start from one force and keep on making the other forces and then you will end up at the starting point okay another method which you can use is the algebraic solution that is summation of all the forces will be zero and in that case the summation of the forces in the x direction should be zero as well as the summation of forces in the y direction should be zero and if you are applying the equilibrium in 3d the summation of fz should also be zero that is in case of 3d summation of fz should also be zero so this is all about equilibrium equilibrium is uh, very very important because whenever you are solving the problems static problems statics so in statics the particles do not move and they remain stationary at a particular point so the particle or body is not moving that means that it is in equilibrium so whenever you are studying statics your body is in equilibrium that means all the resultant forces should be zero so some forces are known to you some forces are unknown to you so uh what you will do you will make different equations like summation of x equal to 0 will give you one equation summation of fy equals to 0 will you give you another equation and in case of 3d this will give you another equation so in these equations you have some known quantities you have some unknown quantities and you can solve for the unknown ones so this is how you are doing in your mechanics course change to main new mobility this is electrical so one thing is a space diagram a space diagram is a, the actual sketch uh, showing the physical conditions of the problem usually provided with the problem statement or represented by the actual physical situation so you can see in this figure so everything is shown actually as this is a truck and, and they are loading some weight on this truck with the help of these strings and everything is shown so this type of diagram is the space diagram while the free body diagram is the sketch that only shows the forces on the selected particle or body and this diagram must be created by you whenever you are solving the problems then you will create this type of diagrams for example for this figure and there are three forces which are acting on the particle one force is the downward force and this force is the force of weight because of the acceleration due to gravity and there are two forces which are acting along the strings and these are the tension forces as shown in the figure TAC and TAB and uh, these forces are inclined with the horizontal with 50 degree and 30 degree so this is the space diagram and this is the free body diagram this is uh, one more problem so this is the space diagram of the problem so this boat is moving in the flow and flow is in the opposite direction and at a particular extent it is tied by three ropes 
so that it will remain in equilibrium and this is the free body diagram so the one tension force will act in this direction so we have drawn like this then another tension force will act along the AB so this is drawn like this another tension force will be acting along the AC so this is drawn like this and one force because of the flow will act in this direction and it is shown like this okay and these are the angles alpha and beta which you can calculate by the using these dimensions so this is how we can prepare the free body diagram this figure show another free body diagram so as you can see this weight is hanging um, by the crane through this rope and this person is pulling this towards him so in this one force is the force of weight which is in the upper downward direction and then another force is the tension force in along AC so this is shown here and another force is the tension force along BC so this is shown here and these are the angles this angle is 5 degree and this angle is 20 degree so this is how we can draw free body diagrams and once free body diagram is drawn then we can use the equilibrium conditions that is summation of the forces should be zero and by apply equilibrium condition it will result into the equations and from the equations by putting known values we can solve for unknown uh, forces and tensions welcome dear students in this video i will discuss vector in 3d space because in solving engineering mechanics problems you will encounter problems in which you have to deal with the three dimensional objects or bodies so you should be well aware about how to express force vector displacement vectors in 3d space now let us see how we can express uh, the vectors in 3d space suppose this is your vector f and these are the axes x y and z and suppose this vector has its origin at means uh, this vector is starting from the origin o and uh, you know uh, these angles so it is inclined with angle theta y to y axis and this plane in which we are having the vector o b a c so this plane is inclined with the x axis by an angle phi now first thing we can do is to resolve the components of this vector in this <coughs> y direction and this horizontal direction so for resolving in the y direction it is very simple because you know this angle then this f y will be simply f cos theta y okay and uh, in horizontal direction we can resolve similarly f h is equal to f sin theta y uh, uh, this is the same as we are doing in 2d so we are resolving the vector on in this plane o b a c so f y will be f cos theta y and f h will be f sin theta y now the next step is to resolve this f h into x and z components because in y we have already resolved now this angle we know phi from here so this fx will be fh cos phi so fx is equal to fh cos phi and fh you can replace from here that is f sin theta y so then your 
एफ एक्स विल बी एफ साइन थीटा वाई कॉस फाइव सिमिलरली यू कैन रिजोल्व दिस एफ एच इन टू जेड डायरेक्शन दैट इज एफ एच साइन फाइव सो एफ जेड विल बी एफ एच साइन फाइव एंड वंस अगेन वी कैन रिप्लेस एफ एच एज एफ साइन थीटा सो एफ साइन थीटा पाई साइन फाइव सो नाउ यूर ऑल द थ्री कंपोनेंट्स आर रिजोल्व एफ वाई एफ वाई इज एफ कॉस थीटा फाइव एफ एक्स इज एफ साइन थीटा फाइव कॉस फाइव एंड एफ जेड इज एफ साइन थीटा वाई साइन फाइव so if you know the angles and uh, the vector then you can resolve the vector in 3d in x y z direction okay now let us move further now suppose you know the direction cosines so this vector f so it is inclined with the angle theta x from x axis then angle theta y from y axis and angle theta z with z axis so we know all the three angles of this vector okay so now we can easily resolve into the component fx will be f cos theta x fy will be f cos theta y and fz will be f cos theta z and also we can write like this f is equal to fx i plus fy j plus fz k in the form of unit vectors which we have learned in the previous video so where i is the unit vector in x direction and j is the unit vector in y direction and k is the unit vector in z direction now we can replace fx fy and fz by these three expressions and uh, you can take f common then your f will be equals to vector f will be equal to f cos theta x i plus cos theta y j plus cos theta z k so this is also written like this delta sorry lambda you can also write uh, this term which is in this bracket as lambda where lambda is cos theta x i plus cos theta y j plus cos theta z k so if you know the angles from all the three axes then what you can you do you can simply calculate delta and you can write f as f into uh, lambda okay so this is how you can express if we know direction cosines and this lambda it is a unit vector along the line of action of f okay so lambda is also a unit vector like this i j and k because this i is having the uh, unit magnitude j is having the unit magnitude k is having the unit magnitude so in the same way this uh, uh, lambda lambda is also a unit vector but its direction is the line of action of f okay and these cos theta x cos theta y and cos theta z they are the direction cosines for f so you will understand it more clearly when we will be solving some problems okay let us move now sometimes uh, is, it is possible that uh, the vector is not given from the origin okay so your origin is here and your vector is here and you know the coordinate of your vector so its initial point is known to you which is m x1 y1 z1 are the coordinates of this initial point and you know the final point this so the coordinates of this final points is x2 y2 z2 so this is the line of action mn 
and in this line this force f is applied so now what you can do you can calculate uh, the distance sorry displacement in x direction so simply subtract x2 by x1 then similarly in y direction and z direction then this vector joining m and this vector will be equals to dx i dyj and dzk okay and uh, we can also express in the form of lambda so f the of will be equals to f into lambda in the same way as we have seen in the previous slide that is you can express any vector f is equal to by its magnitude into the by multiplication or by a unit vector in the same direction so we have done the same thing here <clears throat> now you can calculate lambda by this equation so lambda will be equal to dxi plus dyj plus dzk by d and these components fx will be f dx by d f dy by d and fz will be f dz by z so this is how you can express when uh, your vector is not originating from the origin so whenever you are solving the problems not always your vector originates from origin sometimes it is originating from origin and sometimes it has some coordinates so whenever you are solving the 3d problems you can use these equations to represent your vector so this is all for today's video thank you very much thanks for watching have a nice day welcome dear students in this video i will discuss about equivalent systems of forces for rigid bodies so let us start it is not as always possible to consider the body as a single particle because sometimes body has a large dimension suppose like this and suppose the force is acting here so you cannot always consider this as a single particle sometimes when suppose the size of body is not very large suppose this body so this one body can be considered as a single particle but sometimes size do matter for example in case of trains so trains has a very large size so you cannot consider them as a particle or as for example airplanes big airplanes so in that case we need to consider the size of the body also and the specific points of application of the forces this is also important because as you can see if the forces apply here then it will have some different consequence and if this force is applied here then it will have different consequences so this is also important to uh, the point of application of the force now most bodies in elementary mechanics are assumed to be rigid so this is also a very important point so suppose this is the body so if a force is acting on this body then it is possible that because of the force this body might deform okay and shape changes but in the rigid body mechanics we consider that this body will remain rigid means before the application of the force and after the application of the force the size of the body will remain same means if f is 0 
then also it will the uh, size is same and if we have some f value then also the size is same sorry shape is same so that means that there is no deformations actually deformations are small or they do not affect the conditions of equilibrium or motion of the body now in this uh, video we will discuss the effect of forces exerted on a rigid body so if there is a rigid body suppose and different forces are acting on this body say this is f1 say this is f2 f3 f4 and so on so we will consider the effect of all these forces and we will replace all these forces by a single resultant force okay so what we will do uh, we will replace with a system consisting a moment of a force about a point moment of a force about an axis and moment due to couple so by this we will replace now any system of forces any system of forces acting on a rigid body can be replaced by an equivalent system consisting of one force and one couple so suppose this is the system f1 f2 f3 f4 acting on this body then this can be replaced by a one resultant force and one couple so this is possible so this we will learn in this chapter okay now uh, here you can see external and internal forces so if there is a rigid body as seen in the, here this is the rigid body so this body is having some internal forces means uh, everybody is made up of say different molecules okay so every molecule has force of attraction or forces of repulsion and some other forces also so every body has some internal forces and some external forces okay so generally we do not deal with internal forces in our course of this engineering mechanics we will be dealing with only external forces okay so in this body what are the external forces that are acting so this is the one force f so this is f and then this weight of the body which is acting downward so this is the first force this is the second say and uh, this body is in contact with the surface at two points here and here so we have two reaction forces so this suppose three and this is suppose four so in this uh, body four forces four external forces are acting so these forces we will consider and we will resolve these forces into a resultant force and the couple about a point while we do not consult about internal forces okay now if an opposed each external force can impart a motion of translation or rotation okay so this for these external forces if they are not in equilibrium then what they can do they can impart some motion to the body and the motion can be translation means motion in the uh, linear direction or the motion can be a rotating means there could can be a rotating motion also okay now when we are reducing the resultant forces into a force and couple then this principle principle of transmissibility is very very important or we also call it equivalent forces so what this principle says that it says there's conditions of equilibrium or motion are not affected by 
transmitting a force along its line of action okay so this is the body and this f force is acting in this direction and this is the line of action of this force okay this is the line of action so according to the principle of transmissibility along this line along this line of action we can uh, change the position of the applied force though so this f and this f dash if they are having the same magnitude and uh, they will have the same effect okay means they are the equivalent forces their effect will remain same okay now by using this principle consider this figure so what we can do we can move this force this is the force so suppose this is the line of action this is the line of action okay so by using the principle of transmissibility transmissibility this force can be transferred here okay uh, f dash okay so this is what shown in this figure so by using the principle of transmissibility we can move the force along the line of action and its effect will remain same okay now similarly the same thing is done here so this force p2 it is transmitted at this point similarly this uh, force p2 it is transmitted at this point okay so but the principle of transmissibility may not always apply in determining internal forces and deformations okay so you can determine the uh, motion or external effect of the forces but you cannot determine the internal effect okay uh, because uh, these forces and uh, these forces they will have say uh, means different uh, deformations and effect okay because these forces will pull uh, this forces will pull this side this forces will pull this side so there is some tension effect while the same thing is not there in this case okay because this side is now free okay so there will be no pulling effect so that thing we cannot able to determine but in certain applications this principle of transmissibility is uh, very very useful okay and when you will solve the problems then you will see that you can apply principle of transmissibility in many problems and it is really useful okay vector product of two vectors so this you might have studied in your physics classes so let us revise this concept again concept of the moment of a force about a point is more easily understood through applications of the vector product so when you are calculating the moment of force about a point then for that uh, for uh, calculating this you need to understand the vector products so as you can see in the figure that if there are two vectors p and q so this is the p vector and this is the q vector okay and uh, there is an angle theta between both the vectors then their product vector product which is uh, often represented by p cross q okay so suppose we denote this by v so vector product of both the vectors will be pointing in the plane normal to the plane containing the vector so this is the plane which contains vectors p and q so the do vector product will be outside this plane okay normal to this plane means this angle should be 90 degrees so this product will be perpendicular and pointing outward okay 
while the magnitude of this you can calculate by this formula p magnitude of p into magnitude of q and multiply that by sin theta while the direction you can calculate by the right hand rule so when you curl your fingers from p to q so here is p from p to q you will curl your fingers okay then the direction of this will be given by your thumb the direction of your thumb will give the direction of the resultant vector now there are certain uh, properties of vector products first one is they are not commutative okay so if you are taking the cross product of two vectors then they are not commutative means if this is the p cross q then q cross p will be in the downward direction okay then they are distributive so you can apply the distributive law in vector products and they are not associative okay so associativity law you cannot apply to the vector product so you should always keep in mind these things whenever you are doing the vector products now since we are dealing with the forces and displacements and uh, we will be taking the components and we know that i is the unit vector in x direction and j is the unit vector in y direction and k is the unit vector in z direction okay so let us see what will happen if we take the vector product of i cross i so in case of i cross i i cross i means 1 into 1 into sine of 0 because the angle between the same vector is 0 so this is 0 okay Similarly, if you take i cross j, then you will obtain k because this will be in the di this direction. Then i cross k will be minus j. Similarly, you can obtain j cross i. Okay. Similarly, j cross j will be 0. So, if you are multiplying the vector with the same vector, then the product will be 0. And if you are multiplying by say i cross j, then you will obtain k. So similarly, you can find the vector products of all the unit vectors. Okay. Now vector product in terms of the rectangular coordinates. Okay. So suppose there are two vectors P and your P vector is PXI plus PYJ plus PZ. Okay. and similarly you have q which is equals to qxi plus qyj plus qzk so these vectors and they can be represented through their components and you want to find out the vector products of these two vectors so this is what you get when you multiply okay so when you take the product of this so this will zero because same vector then you multiply by this so okay and then you multiply by this okay similarly all other terms and take the term with having same directions common then you will find that the vector product will be py qz minus puz qy into i then pz qx minus px qz j and px qy minus py qx into k so this you can obtain when you take the vector products of p and q or more easily means in uh, uh, easy form to remember you can write in the form of a determinant so on the top of the uh, determinant you can write i jk then px py pz 
qx qy qz okay so when you take i say i and then i in i direction we have py qz these two minus this pz qy so you can easily remember this vector product by remembering this A force vector is defined by its magnitude and direction as we have seen in the previous lectures. Now its effect on the rigid body also depend on its point of application. So as you can see in this figure, this is the force vector and the point of application is A. Okay. Now, if this point of application is changed, say here or anybody means anywhere in the surface, then its effect will be different. Okay. So the effect of this force will also depend on this point of application. Now, the moment of this force, which is applied on A about O, O is the axis of this body is defined as m o m is the moment and moment is about o so this o is representing the point about which we are calculating the moment so m o will be equal to r cross f where r is the distance between the point of application and the axis okay so r cross f is the moment of f about o and this moment vector m o is perpendicular to the plane containing o and the force f so suppose we draw a plane as you can see by this blue color that this is the plane which is passing through o as well as this f so if uh, this is the case uh, then the resultant mo is perpendicular to this plane okay as we have seen in the cross product of vectors so same is the case here okay so mo is perpendicular to this plane containing o and f and uh, the magnitude of mo you can measure by this equation m o will be equal to r into f into sine theta where theta is the angle between f and the displacement vector o a okay so this is the angle theta while r is the magnitude of this displacement and f is the magnitude of this force while the direction of this moment you can calculate by the right hand thumb rule okay right hand rule so when you move from this uh, in this direction from here to here okay then uh, the direction of the moment will be given by your thumb okay as we can have seen in the case of vector product so if you are moving from this to this point then the thumb will give you the direction of the moment any force f dash so suppose we apply any other force f dash that has the same magnitude as direction as f so we apply any other force f dash which is having the same direction and same magnitude so that force is equivalent if it also has the same line of action so if the force is applied along this line this line so that force will also have the same uh, effect okay the, uh, that means it will give the same moment okay now consider the two dimensional structure two dimensional structures are those that have length and breadth but negligible depth so suppose this is the 
2D structure which do not have much breadth okay and uh, we have this plane point O and the force is applied in the same plane F so the moment of uh, this force is M0 and by the right hand rule the moment vector will be out of this plane okay now with the force tells to rotate the structure clockwise means uh, uh, the way in which clock rotates okay sorry anti clockwise anti clockwise this is the anti clockwise uh, you can see and this is the anti clockwise okay then uh, the moment vector is out of the plane of the structure and the magnitude is positive so for anti clockwise case we consider that the m0 is positive while if the force tends to rotate the clockwise so this is the clockwise okay so then we consider that the moment of the force is negative and it will point into the downward direction okay so uh, while in this case the moment vector will point in the upward direction okay so this is how you can calculate the moment for a 2d case now let us see Wagner's theorem this theorem is very important it, uh, this theorem says that the moment about a given point O of the resultant of several concurrent forces. Suppose we are having several concurrent forces F1, F2, F3, F4 and these forces are concurrent means they are passing through the same point. And then the moment of these forces about this point is equal to the sum of the moments of the various moments about the same point okay means moment of the resultant you can write on the rhs oh, sorry left left hand side r cross here in this bracket this is the resultant will be equals to r cross f1 means moment of this force plus r cross f2 means moment of this force plus moment of this force plus moment of this force and so on okay so by using Verignon's theorem you can write in this way and Verignon theorem makes it possible to replace the direct determinations of the moment of force by the moment of two or more components of force so suppose if, you, if there is a force then instead of calculating the moment of Directly, you, what you can do, you can break the force into components, say X and Y and Z components, and then you can calculate the moment of each component and then simply add that, then you will get the total moment. Now, let us see the rectangular components of the moments of a force about O means origin. Suppose this is the force F. And these are the three components of the force Fxi, Fyj and Fzk and we have to calculate the moment of this force about the point O which is also the origin okay. So as you, uh, you know that moment about origin or can be calculated by this cross product R cross F. Now this R vector you can simply write because the coordinates of this point is x, y, z. So you can write r vector as xi plus yj plus zk. And similarly, you know the components of the force, so you can write f as fxi, fyj and fzk. Then this moment vector mxi plus myj plus mzk will be simply equals to the cross product, which we can also write in the form of determinant so that you can easily remember it so in the first row you will write ijk in the second row you will write the 
displacement vector x, y, and j, and in the third row you will write the components of force that is fx, fy, and fj. And then what you need to do, you simply uh, open this determinant, and you will get this y f z minus z f y i and so on. So this is how you can calculate the moment about the origin. Now we'll see if we have to calculate the moment of force about at point B, which is not at the origin, which is slightly different from the origin. So that uh, moment about B will be equals to RAB where A is the point of application and B is the point at which we want to calculate the moment. So we will write R A cross B, sorry A slash B cross F. Now we need to write this R A slash B. So R A slash B can be written as position vector of A minus position vector of B. So that will be equals to x a minus x b i plus y a minus y b j plus z a minus z b k. And this force you simply write f x i plus f y j plus f z k. Now for calculating the moment you simply write these two vectors in the form of determinant. So in the first row i j k, in the second row uh, this components of position vector and in the third row components of force vector and when you open this determinant you can calculate the moment of force f sorry moment of this force f about point b now we'll see the rectangular components of the moment of force for a 2d structure so this is your 2d structure okay and this is the force f it has two component fx i and fyj then your moment will be this x fy minus y f z because other two term will vanish okay so as you can see this is the term which we have operated previously for 3d case now this term will vanish out because this fz is 0, z is 0, okay. Again, in this case, this z is 0, fz is 0. So only this term will left out, okay. So your moment will be x, f, y minus y, f, x. And it will be in the k direction. And similarly, you can obtain the moment about a point B, which is different from the origin, okay. As in this case. So in, this, in that case, you simply replace this x and y by x i a minus x b and y a minus y b. So this is how you can calculate the moment for a 2D structure. So this you might have studied in your physics classes. So here we are having two vectors, P and Q, and uh, theta is the angle between two vectors. Then scalar product or dot product between P and Q is written as P dot Q, and it is equals to P Q cos theta now scalar product has some properties like scalar product is commutative that is p dot q and q dot p is the same unlike the vector product then scalar product is distributive so if you have two vectors q1 plus q2 and uh, then you, if you want to take the dot product of p dot the sum 
and it will be same as p dot q1 plus p dot q2 but it is not associative okay so p dot q dot s will not be equal to p dot q dot s okay so these are some of the properties of scalar products now let us do the scalar product with some cartesian components so suppose you are having two vectors p which is pxi plus pyj plus pzk then vector q is qxi plus qyj plus qzk now first we need to know the scalar products of unit vectors so suppose you have i dot i then i dot i means 1 into 1 into cos 0 and cos 0 is 1 so i dot i will be 1 similarly j dot j is 1 k dot k is 1 now i dot j means when you are multiplying the two unit vectors that are perpendicular to each other then since cos 90 is 0 so i dot j is 0 similarly j dot j is j dot k is 0 and k dot i is 0 <coughs> now when you open these brackets so suppose let us take this so px will be multiplied with this qx and then qy and qz so i dot i will be 1 so px qx you will get and then i dot j this will be 0 i dot k this will be 0 so two terms will be 0 similarly from the second term by multiplying this and uh, this one you will get second term and similarly the third term then your p dot q will be p x q x plus p y q y plus p z q z so you can say that when you are taking the dot product of or scalar product of two vectors then they are simply the multiplication of the components in the same direction okay similarly p dot p that is when you are multiplying the vector with its uh, itself then it will be simply the square of the component in each direction now we will uh, see some of the applications of uh, scalar products of vectors so again these are the two vectors p and q and uh, angle between them is theta then p dot q is p q cos theta as we have already seen which is equals to p x q x plus p y q y plus p z q z now from this you can find the angle between them that is cos theta will be equals to this p x q x plus p y q y plus p z q z divided by p q that means if you know the components of the two vectors uh, and the two vectors then you can find the angle between the two vectors by this now one more thing <coughs> suppose you want the projection of this vector p on this axis o l okay so projection of a vector on a given axis this thing you need uh, when you are solving engineering mechanics problem so sometime you need to project the vector on a particular axis so that you can study the effect of that vector on that along that particular axis okay so this uh, projection will be p o l so we denote this projection by p o l then that will be equals to p cos theta okay now you can find this p dot q will be p q cos theta we already know this and uh, when we divide this by q then on the rhs you get p cos theta which is simply the projection of p along the ol so if you want to find the projection of p along this line then what you need to do you need to simply take the scalar product and divide it by the 
uh, vector along which you are taking the projection okay then uh, suppose you want to project the vector p along this line ol once again but this time you know the unit vector lambda along ol so in this case you <coughs> are projecting along q uh, but uh, here you are projecting uh, in the direction of ol where you know the unit vector okay so that is very simple p ol will be p dot delta uh, where sorry we p dot lambda and uh, this lambda we already know that it is given by cos theta x i plus cos theta y j plus cos theta z k and p is p x p y plus p z so simply you need to multiply because we are taking the dot product so we need to simply multiply the components that is p x cos theta x plus p y cos theta y plus p z cos theta z so this is how you can take the projection along any axis for which you know the unit vector now let us see sometimes you need the uh, mixed triple products that is you want to calculate dot product as well as the cross product so these are the three vectors p q and s and we want to take the mixed triple product of uh, these three vectors that is s dot p plus q so this is the scalar one okay because uh, p cross q is the vector and this is the vector and when we take the dot product of two vectors then it is the scalar so answer will be the scalar now suppose you are having these three vectors so there are multiple combinations that are possible so there are six combinations that are possible so when you take the mixed triple product the magnitude will remain same in all these combinations okay so whether you are taking s dot uh, s dot p uh, cross q or p dot q cross s or anything any any combination the magnitude will remain same but sign changes so this is what you will get when you try so there are three cases which are having a positive magnitude and there are three cases which are having the negative magnitude okay now uh, suppose take the exam uh, example say take three vectors p s p x plus q x plus p z then q is q x q y q z then s is s x s y and s z and if you do the mixed triple product then you will get this and this is equals to the determinant okay so whenever you are taking the mixed triple product what you need to do you simply take the determinant of the components in x y and z directions so that is very very simple okay now we already know that moment of a force about a point o is given as mo which is simply the cross product of the displacement vector at which the force is applied with the force now we want to calculate the scalar moment mol means we want to calculate the moment of force about this axis okay we know about this point now we want to calculate about this axis so suppose this lambda is the unit vector in the direction of ol and your this is mo so if you want to calculate the scalar moment then this is simply the projection of mo on the ol and you can calculate the projection by simply taking the dot product of two that is lambda dot m o which is equals to lambda dot r cross f okay 
Now, similarly, we can calculate the moments of F about the coordinate axes, X, Y, and Z. And this again, you can also do by simply doing the dot product and you will get these expressions. That is MX will be equals to Y F Z minus Z F Y. M Y will be equals to Z F X minus X F Z. And M Z is equal to X F Y minus Y F X. Now suppose you want to calculate the moment of a force about uh, some arbitrary axis that is suppose this is your force f applied at point a and this is the origin and we want to calculate the moment of this force about this axis okay so suppose uh, we denote this axis by bl okay then mbl will be equals to the unit vector along this axis that is lambda and, and dot product of MB means the moment of this force about point B. Now moment of force about point B can be calculated simply by R uh, AB that is position vector of A minus position vector of B and cross F. And uh, we need to simply take the dot product. Okay. And one important thing is that the resultant means uh, this force which we will be getting is independent of the point B. Means you can take point B anywhere, here, 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 anywhere. The answer will remain the same. Now we will do one problem on the moment of force about an axis. So this is your problem. This is the cube and a force is applied along this direction fc okay and this ag is the diagonal so we need to calculate the moment of this force p about a in the first part then second part we need to calculate the moment about the edge ab about this edge then we need to calculate the moment about the diagonal ag and then we need to determine the perpendicular distance between the A, G and F, C. Okay. So let us start this problem. Now, first part is the moment about A. So we have assumed the origin at this point. Okay. And these are our unit vectors, I, J and K. So the vector RFA is because of our force is applied at F, right? So if we want to find the moment about A, then we need to find this AF. Okay. So AF will be equals to position vector of F minus position vector of A. Now, coordinates of F are X is A, Y is 0 and Z is A. While for A, we have X 0, Y is A and Z is A. Okay. So, we can write F as a i plus a k minus uh, we have a j plus a k so this k will cancel out then will r f a will be a i minus j as you can see here a i minus a j and you can take a as common now this F, uh, sorry, this uh, force is denoted by P. So similarly, uh, P is, P will be equals to unit vector in the direction of FC, uh, lambda and 
magnitude of p okay now lambda you can calculate lambda will be equals to fc divided by magnitude of fc okay now magnitude is very simple you can have uh, a square plus a square while this on the top we have position vector of c so c is x is a y is a and z is zero okay so <clears throat> position vector of c minus position vector of a okay so this will be equals to a i plus a j minus a i plus a k so this i will cancel out and then you add a j minus k okay so finally we will get p as 1 by under root 2 uh, j minus k okay now when you need to find the moment then simply you take the uh, cross product RFA into P that is RFA is this and uh, P is this okay so when you take the cross product you will get this answer and you can take the cross product by simply writing this I J and K and uh, here you will have A minus A and 0 uh, this one and uh, here you have uh, 0 p by root 2 and minus p by root 2 so when you open the determinant you will get this answer okay now next uh, b part of the problem is moment of p about a b okay so AB is this means AB is in the direction of uh, X axis. So as we know that uh, if we want to calculate the moment along any axis, then we need to simply multiply the unit vector along that axis and the moment about a point A. Okay. So we need to simply carry out the dot product and we know that i dot i is 1 and i dot j is 0 so when we take a dot product only the components in i direction will remain that is this is i and this is ma so this term will be 0 this term will be 0 so we get the term only in x direction that is mab will be equals to ap by root Now this is the third part of the problem C so moment of P along this diagonal okay so again now we need to calculate this lambda so lambda will be equals to AG upon magnitude of AG this will be equals to position vector of G minus position vector of a and this is the magnitude so when we do this uh, you will get lambda vector as this 
1 by root 3 i minus j minus k and uh, m a you already know then you will need to take the simply the dot product which you can uh, this i dot i will be 1 and i dot j i dot i and uh, j dot uh, j and k dot k will be 1 while i dot j refer to 0 j dot k will be 0 and i dot k is also 0 so by using the same rule we will get this answer that is m a g will be equals to minus a p under root 6 now the third part is the you need to calculate the perpendicular distance between uh, f c and a g so as you can see in this figure this is the perpendicular distance okay now this a g lambda we have just calculated and it means unit vector along this direction and uh, uh, p we already know p p is this p by root 2 j minus k and this we have just calculated so if you take the dot product of these two vectors then it will come out to be this p by root 6 0 minus 1 plus 1 and this is 0 okay so it means that this p and this lambda they are perpendicular because perpendicular of 2 means uh, if two vectors are perpendicular that is i and j then their dot product i and j is 0 okay this we know that so this uh, product is coming out to be 0 it means that these two vectors are perpendicular to each other okay now this moment uh, we know and uh, this moment we can also calculate because we know that moment can be also calculated by the force into the perpendicular distance okay so this is the force and this is the perpendicular distance so we need to simply equate these two terms uh, then you will get d as uh, a by under root 6 so this is how we can solve these type of problems okay welcome dear students in this video i will discuss moment of a couple so consider two forces this force is f and another force minus f having the same magnitude and parallel line of action and opposite sense so these two forces they have the same magnitude and their line of action is parallel but their sense is opposite so these two force form a couple now you can find the moment of the couple so for that suppose this is the force and uh, this force is applied at a and this r a is the position vector of point a so we know that for any force we can calculate the moment as r cross f so for this force f the moment will be r a cross f similarly the moment of uh, this force minus f can be calculated and uh, this will be r b cross minus f because the direction of this force is opposite so the sign is negative now we can open this uh, bracket so then you will obtain r a minus r b cross f because f is common and uh, from the vector mechanics you can know that r a minus r b is equals to r okay so this will be equals to r cross f and r cross f you know that it is the cross product so which are also equals to r f sin theta or if you calculate the r sin theta then that will be d so that will be equals to f d so this is how you can calculate the 
मोमेंट ऑफ द कपल नाउ दिस मोमेंट वेक्टर ऑफ द कपल इज इंडिपेंडेंट ऑफ द चॉइस ऑफ द ओरिजिन ऑफ द कोऑर्डिनेट एक्सिस बिकॉज दिस वेक्टर आर दिस डज नॉट डिपेंड ऑन द ओरिजिन ओरिजिन कैन बी एनी वेयर दिस वेक्टर विल रिमेन सेम आर वेक्टर बिकॉज दिस वेक्टर डिपेंड्स ऑन द पॉइंट ऑफ एप्लीकेशन ऑफ द फोर्सेस so we can say that moment vector of the couple is independent of the choice of the origin that is it is a free vector okay because it does not depend on the origin so it is a free vector and that can be applied at any point with the same effect okay so you can move this force uh, moment vector m anywhere and its effect will remain the same now suppose uh, there are two couples okay so this first couple it is formed by the force f1 and minus f1 and the distance is d1 and another couple this is formed by the force is f2 and minus f2 and the distance perpendicular and this parallel distance is d2 then these two couples will have equal moment vector if these conditions are satisfied first condition is f1 d1 equals to f2 d2 then second condition is the two couple lie in the parallel planes means this plane and this plane both these planes are parallel to each other and the third condition is the two couples have the same sense or tendency to cause rotation in the same direction so if you look at this top one so this will cause rotation in this direction okay and this lower one will also cause the rotation in this direction so we can say that they are uh, causing the rotation in the same direction so we can say that these two couples are equal because all the conditions are satisfied all the three conditions are satisfied now we look into the moment addition of the couples so suppose we are having two couples uh, one couple is in the plane p1 so this is the plane p1 this one which contains these forces f1 and minus f1 and the moment of this forces r m1 equal to r cross f1 where r is the displacement vector between point a and b similarly there is another plane p2 which is intersecting this plane p1 at point at this line which is uh, through ab so and uh, this p2 plane contains the forces f2 and minus f2 so again you can calculate the moment m2 which will be equals to r cross f2 okay now these forces you can calculate the resultant of these forces f1 and f2 you can calculate r by parallelogram law of vector addition similarly the resultant of minus f1 and minus f2 will be minus r okay so this resultant r this is also forming a couple okay and that couple can be calculated as r cross capital r where r is the uh, this vector and displacement vector between point a and b and this capital r is the resultant and then you can write like this because this capital r is the summation of these f1 and f2 so we can also write r cross f1 plus f2 now using varignon's theorem uh, we can have this Uh, capital m will be equal to r cross f1 plus r cross f2 now this r cross f1 is m1 and r cross f2 is m2 uh, m2 so we can say that these the individual couples which is formed by the two forces f1 and f2 okay which by in two intersecting planes is equals to the couple formed by the resultant okay so you can say that the sum of the two couples is also a couple okay because these are the two couples m1 and m2 
so their sum is also a couple m that is equal to the vector sum of the two couples so like we can add two forces uh, f1 and f2 and we can get their resultant in the same way we can add two couples m1 and m2 and we can get the resultant of two couples and that is equal to the vector sum of the two couples in the same way we can add three couples four couples and so on now these couples can be represented by vectors so these are the forces in the first figure f and these two forces f and minus f they are forming this couple m and as we know that this uh, uh, couple is a free vector so we can place here it as origin or it can be placed here in this plane so its effect will remain same and now since this is a vector so we can break the uh, couple vector into the component vectors uh, so these are the three components mx my and mz in the x y and z direction and the couple vectors obey the law of addition of vectors so this we know that and third point is couple vectors are free vectors that is the point of application is not significant okay so this is very important we can move couple vectors as per our requirement and their effect will remain same and couple vectors may be resolved into component vectors Now we will see the resolution of a force into a force and a couple. So as you can see in this figure, so this is the force F which is applied at point A and this is the point O or you can consider it as origin and this is that is position vector of A which is represented by r now we can resolve this force into a force and a couple for that what we can do uh, we can apply force f and minus f at this point o now because we have applied f and minus f so its effect will cancel out so uh, means its effect will remain same and now what uh, we can do uh, these two forces um, this this one and uh, this one uh, they will form the couple so from this force this couple is formed and uh, this force we has shown as it is so what we have done here this is the single force okay now if we want to move this force to this point o so we can do um, this but we have to add one couple okay and that couple should be uh, this r cross f means the dis uh, displacement through which we are moving it okay so this is what written here force vector f cannot be simply moved to o so we cannot move it simply because if we move simply then its effect will change if we want that the effect will remain same then we have to add a couple okay so then we can move our force to another point so this is what written here attaching equal and opposite force vectors at o produces no net effect on the body and the three forces may be replaced by an equivalent force vector and a couple vector okay now in this uh, figure you can see again we are having a force f applied at a okay now uh, suppose uh, this force vector we can move here we have seen in the last slide and this now again now suppose if we want to move from o to o dash okay then what we have to do so moving force f moving f from a to a different point o dash requires the addition of a different couple vector okay so this is your force f if you move here then the couple vector will be different and if you move at o dash then the couple vector will be different okay 
so here you are adding mo but here you have to add mo dash and this mo will be r cross f while mo dash will be r dash cross f and these two are related to each other means mo dash and mo dash are related to each other and mo dash will be mo plus s cross f where s is this distance between o and o dash okay so this is how these mo and mo dash are related uh, now the in conclusion moving the force couple system from o to o dash requires the addition of the moment of the force at o about o dash okay so we want to move the this system from o to o dash then we need we should add a moment this moment of force and uh, uh, from this okay and this is the displacement vector so s cross f this is the addition of the moment of the force at o about o dash so this we have to do then we can transform it so thanks for watching the video thanks everyone have a nice day Welcome dear students, in this video we will learn how to reduce a system of forces into a force and couple system. So let us start. So suppose this is the system of forces which is applied on a rigid body at different points. So suppose this force F1 is applied at point A1 then this force F2 is applied at point A2 similarly F3 is applied at F3 and these are the position vectors of point A1, A2 and A3 okay so as we know as we have learned in the previous lecture that uh, you can reduce this force F1 into a force and couple system when you shift this force at point O so similarly we can do for all the three forces and we can reduce all the three forces at O. So the second figure you can see that this F1 force is reduced to a force F1 plus moment M1 at O similarly for F2 and F3. So from the figure it is clear that a system of forces may be replaced by a collection of force couple systems acting at point O. Now uh, we are having say three different forces so we can have a resultant of these three forces. So suppose that resultant is represented by capital R. Similarly we can find the resultant of all the moments M1, M2 and M3. So the force and couple vectors may be combined into a resultant force vector and a resultant couple vector. So this is how we can do this. Now one more thing we can do suppose uh, now you want to um, move this force couple system to another point. So this we have also seen in the last uh, video that uh, we can move a force couple system to a different po uh, point and for that we just need to add a moment. So this is how we can do this. Suppose we want to move this force couple system from O to O dash and suppose this S is the displacement vector between O and O dash then our resultant will be a force R plus a moment m o dash and m o dash will be equals to m o plus the moment of this point o about o dash okay now the two systems of forces are equivalent if they can be reduced to the same force couple system suppose this is one system of the forces suppose we have another system and we can reduce both the system to a same force coupled system 
then we can say that these two systems are equivalent to each other. Now we will see further deductions of a system of forces. Now suppose if the resultant force and couple at O are mutually perpendicular, they can be replaced by a single force acting along a new line of action. So if the force and the couple, they are mutually perpendicular. Uh, suppose this is your force. Okay. And this is your moment. And they are mutually perpendicular. So we can replace this system by a single force acting along a new line of action. Okay. Now the resultant force couple system for a system of forces will be mutually perpendicular if. Okay, so if these three conditions are satisfied, then the system of force couple system we will get is mutually perpendicular to each other. So first case is the forces are concurrent. So if we are having three forces, say P, Q and S, and they are passing through the same point A, that means that these forces are concurrent and these forces can be reduced to this situation. Okay. So means we can reduce these forces into a perpendicular force couple system. Similarly, if the forces are coplanar, means all the forces lies on the same plane, then again, this can also be reduced to this type of a system. And third point is if the forces are parallel. So if all the forces are parallel, then we can reduce this force system as well to a force and couple system that are perpendicular to each other. Now suppose a system of coplanar forces is reduced to a force couple system that is mutually perpendicular. Okay. So this is our initial force system. Now we have reduced this system into a force and couple system and this force and couple system, they are mutually perpendicular to each other. Now we can move this uh, means we can uh, this transform this force couple system into a resultant force. Okay. So we can transform, uh, transform this force R and couple system into a resultant force R. But for that you have to move this force to a new line of action. So uh, suppose this is the initial line of action. And now your new line of action will be this. That is different from this. Okay. These two line of actions are different. Okay. So system can be reduced to a single force by moving the line of action of R until its moment about O becomes MOR. So this D, you can calculate D as D should be equals to this moment divided by the force R. Okay. So this is the reverse which we have studied in the previous videos that uh, we can <coughs> transform a force into a force couple system. We can do this. So here we are doing the reverse process. We are transforming a force and couple system into a force. Okay. So we can do this thing in terms of component also. Suppose this is our force couple system and now suppose you can reduce this force into two components Rx and Ry. Sorry. So we can reduce this uh, system into uh, like this means we can move these uh, two components here. So this uh, system means uh, two components Rx and Ry plus moment is reduced to a force system which is having a component Rx and Ry. And similarly we can do in the y direction also. So here we have moved the, moved the uh, resultant force in the x direction and here we have moved the resultant force in 
y direction and we can calculate the magnitude to which we have to move the force so x is equals to moment divided by r y and here y is the moment divided by r x so this is the relation basically so thanks for watching the video thanks everyone welcome dear students in this video we will discuss equilibrium of rigid bodies now for a rigid body in static equilibrium all the external forces and moments should be balanced that means that there should be no translational motion as well as no rotatory motion so as in the case of particles uh, when we studied the equilibrium of particles uh, then we see that uh, there is no unbalanced force and all the resultant forces should be zero similarly for a rigid body to be in equilibrium the necessary and sufficient condition is that all the forces and moments should be zero the resultant of all the forces and resultant of all the moments should be zero that means summation of all the external forces should be zero and similarly summation of all the moments at a particular point should be zero and this thing we can also write in the form of rectangular components so we will be having six scalar equations so for forces summation of fx should be zero summation of fy should be zero summation of fz should be zero similarly for moments summation of mx summation of my and summation of mz should be zero now first step to solve the rigid body equilibrium problems is to prepare a free body diagram okay so suppose this is the figure this is our rigid body okay so first step is to prepare a free body diagram okay so this is the actual figure and now what we have to do we have to select the extent of the free body and detach it from the ground and all other bodies okay so here we have prepared a free body diagram and we have detached the bodies from here so because our body is connected here but we have detached it and now we have to indicate the point of application magnitude and direction of external forces including the rigid body weight so we have to show all the forces okay so for example uh, here a weight is hanging so we have to show this force then we have some weight of the body so that can be applied at the center of gravity so this is shown here and then we have some reaction forces so this is a roller type of support so here we have uh, this reaction and uh, here we have this type of reaction okay so we have to indicate the point of application and assume direction of unknown applied forces if we do not know the direction of any force then we have to assume some direction and then we have to show the direction of unknown applied forces these usually consist of reactions through which the ground and other bodies oppose the possible motion of the rigid body so you have to identify and the reaction forces means from where the reaction forces might act and you have to assume some direction for that and then you have to show on the free body diagram then include the dimension necessary to compute the moments so because whenever we are calculating the equilibrium problem then we need to calculate the moment and equate it to zero 
so we need dimensions for example in this case we have these dimensions 2 meter and 4 meter and this 1.5 meter so these dimensions would also be included in the free body diagram now let us understand the reaction forces when uh, there is some support because whenever you are studying the equilibrium problems for rigid bodies then uh, you will have to show the unknown reactions so how will you showing up those reactions so let us see that now suppose your body is having some roller type of support this type of support or some rocker type of support or your body is placed on some frictionless surface then you will be showing the reaction as normal to the surface okay so the reaction will always be normal like this means perpendicular at the point of contact so the direction is known known line of action that is always perpendicular okay similarly suppose uh, if your body is connected with a cable or some link then the direction of reaction will be in the line of cable or in the line of link okay so you should always show reaction like this and in the third case suppose your body is uh, on a collar which is and the collar is on this friction, frictionless rod so that this can move okay so and the same is the case with frictionless pin in slot so that this can move so in that uh, case you will uh, represent the friction uh, reaction as perpendicular to this axis okay so whatever this axis is so you will take this 90 degree angle and you will represent the reaction like that so in all these supports the direction of the force is known to you now uh, suppose we are having a frictionless pin or hinge okay so your body is placed on a frictionless pin or hinge or it is simply placed on a rough surface okay so in that case the direction is unknown okay so you have to represent the reaction force by uh, f for which you do not know the direction okay so this alpha is unknown okay and uh, you can also break into the components so suppose if this is your f then this is will be fx and this will be f by y so in these type of supports you have to show reaction force like this while in case of fixed support if your body is fixed at some location then you have to add one couple also so unknown force plus a couple this is how you will show the reactions for fixed support okay now consider this body so and this body is in 2d so we are considering the 2d case equilibrium of a rigid body in two dimensions okay so now for this case because we are dealing with x and y direction so fz is zero and similarly there is no moment in x and y directions okay while all the moments will be in z directions okay now what we can do we can break all these forces into the components so this p force can be baked into px and py similarly for q and s then we will have the weight of the body so that can be shown vertically downwards and uh, there are two supports okay so at this support uh, this is a hinge type of support so we will have an unknown and, and direction force so which we can show by two components okay 
and uh, this is a roller type of support so for roller type of support we have just seen that the re uh, reaction force is perpendicular so now we have uh, placed all the forces okay now there are three equations that will be formed with three unknowns okay so these are summation of fx is zero summation of fy is zero and the summation of m at any point so in this case we have considered a point so summation of a is equals to zero now what we can do we can always uh, use some another equation also so we can replace say summation of fy with summation of mb so so always three equations should be there okay uh, we cannot use four equations but only three equations but uh, we can uh, replace the equation okay so we can replace uh, fx also in place of fx we can use summation of fy0 summation of ma is equal to 0 and summation of mv is equal to 0 so in this case we can find the unknown forces some forces are known some forces are unknown especially reactions so you can find the unknown reactions Now, in some cases, some statically indeterminate reactions are formed. So, there are three cases. So, as you can see in the first case, in this case, more unknowns than equations. Okay. So, you will be having four unknowns, but you can only form three equations. So, we cannot solve this type of problem. Similarly, in this case, fewer unknowns than equations so again we are having fewer unknowns than equations and this is partially constrained okay so this figure is partially constrained means in some direction its movement is not possible okay so suppose uh, uh, you can see here we are having Px, Qx and Sx but uh, there is no force in the uh, negative x direction okay so this is partially constrained here we are having no reaction force okay no reaction force which can balance these forces okay and uh, similarly uh, we have again in the third figure also equal number equations and uh, unknowns but improperly constrained okay so again we do not have any reaction force in this direction okay so these type of problems are not possible to solve now let us solve a problem uh, related to equilibrium of rigid body so this is the same figure which we have discussed and uh, we have also uh, prepared the free body diagram okay so this is our problem a fixed crane has a mass of 1000 kg so mass of this crane is 1000 kg and it is used to lift a 2400 kg crate so this crane is used to lift this weight which is 2400 okay it is held in place by a pin at a so here we are having a pin support while at b we are having a rocker support okay the center of gravity of the crane is located at g so this is the center of gravity okay and we have to determine the components of the reactions at A and B. And this should be the solution procedure. Create a free body diagram. Then determine B by solving the equation for the sum of the moments of all forces about A. Then determine reactions at A by solving the equations for the sum of all horizontal force and vertical forces and then check the values obtained okay so let us see the solution 
so this free body diagram we have already uh, made in the previous slides also so we are using same free body diagram so this is the weight this is the weight of the crane this is the weight which crane is lifting so both will act downward and uh, at the pin support we will be having two reactions while at the rocker support we will be having only one reaction okay so now first step is to equate the moment at a equals to zero okay so this is our a point okay now at a point we will be having the moment of this force this force and b okay now the moment of this b will be uh, uh, this is our a okay so b will rotate in the anti clockwise direction b rotate in the anti clockwise direction so this is positive and the moment of these forces are in clockwise directions okay so they are negative so b into 1.5 this is the 1.5 distance and 9.81 into 2 while 23.5 into 6 this distance okay so when you solve this uh, equation you will get b is equal to 107.1 k newton now we will take summation of fx is equal to 0 so in the x direction we have only two force ax and b so ax plus b should be 0 from this you can get a as minus 107.1 kN now this minus sign means that ax should act in this direction okay ax will act in this direction and similarly you can calculate a by y equating summation of f y is equal to 0 then in the y direction we have a y in the positive okay this, if you are considering this as positive then this is negative this is negative this one so three forces are there in the y direction so sum of all the three forces is 0 then you can get a y is equal to 33.3 kilo newton okay so this is how you can solve the problems of rigid body equilibrium so thanks everyone thanks for watching the video have a nice day welcome dear students in this video we will discuss equilibrium of a two force body so consider this body and this is the t section and suppose it is applied with two forces f1 at a and f2 at b okay now for static equilibrium the sum of moments about a must be zero because we know that for equilibrium the sum of moments about any point plus the forces resultant force should be zero so the sum of moments about a must be zero or we can do for b also the sum of moments about b should also be zero now the moments of f2 must be zero now because f1 is acting at a so its moment will be zero now for the moment of f2 about a to be equal to zero it follows that f2 must pass through a because suppose if f2 is not passing through a suppose like f2 is this then there will be a component which will bring some moment so for the moment of f2 to be equal to zero about a f2 must pass through a okay similarly the line of action of f1 must pass through b so similarly we can do for this for the sum of moments about b to be zero now considering these conditions we can see that the sum of forces in any direction must be zero leads to the conclusion that f1 and f2 must have equal magnitude but opposite sense 
okay so if uh, we want that a uh, two force body should be in equilibrium then the applied forces should be equal in magnitude but opposite in sense and their line of action should also be the same so this we can conclude now in this slide we have to draw the free body diagram for this problem draw the free body diagram of the dumpster d of the truck which was which has a weight of 5000 pound and a center of gravity at g <clears throat> so this dumpster it has a weight of 5000 pound and this is the center of gravity and it is supported by a pin at a and a pin connected hydraulic diameter at bc so there are two connections this is the pin and this is pin connected hydraulic cylinder okay so this is the free body diagram so as we know the weight always acts vertically downward so the weight force is shown here okay and this angle will be 20 degree now this is the pin connection so we will be having the reaction force with unknown direction so we will have we will be having two reactions ax and ay and at point b we will be having uh, this type of reaction with known direction so we have drawn the reaction force fbc okay and this angle will be 20 degree plus 30 degree so this is the free body diagram of this problem so similarly we can draw free body diagram for any problem <coughs> now let us solve one problem and this is a break of the airplane as an airplane's brake are applied the nose wheel exerts two forces on the end of the landing gear okay so when we are applying the brake this nose this will appear uh, exerting the forces one force is this and another force is this okay on the landing gear determine the vertical and horizontal components of the reaction at the pin c so here we have to determine the reaction and the force in a strut a b and we have to determine the force acting on this strut okay so this is the free body diagram of this problem <coughs> so this is the reaction force Uh, these, uh, this is the applied force uh, 6 newton and 2 newton so this is these are given in the problem now here we will be having two reaction forces at c so we will be having this type of uh, reaction force so we can draw the two components c y and c x and here we will be having one force in this direction okay so we have drawn this FAB okay and these are the distances required distances okay so they are taken from here now let us see the solution of this problem so we have to equate the moment about C also for equilibrium moment of about C must be zero so this is our C point okay so we will be having moment because of this force this force and this force three forces okay so two into one this distance is one okay and the moment because of the two forces anti-clockwise and uh, six this is the clockwise okay so we have minus six into and this distance we can calculate by trigonometry 110 20 degree plus now this force will also have two components okay so we have fab sine 50 degree 
into 0.4 and minus FAB cos 50 degree and this is the distance 0.4 10 20 degree so this must be 0 so when we solve this we get FAB is equal to 0 0.864 kilo Newton now we should also have summation of fx is equal to 0 and summation of fy should be equal also to 0. So in f direction we have uh, this force, okay, cx, we have cx and we have this component and we have 2 newton. 3 forces are there in the x direction so we can write 0.86 37 sine 50 plus 2 they are in the same direction okay minus cx cx in the opposite direction so when we solve this we get cx is equal to 2.66 kilo newton similarly in the y direction also we will be having three forces 6 kilo newton then one component of this force fab cos 50 okay and cy so from this we can get cy is equal to 6.56 kilo newton so this is how we can solve the problems of equilibrium of a two force body so this is all for this video uh, thanks for watching have a nice day thanks welcome dear students in this video, I will discuss equilibrium of a three-force body. Now consider this body. Three forces are applied on the body F1, F2 and F3. Now assume that the line of action of these forces F2 and F1, they are intersecting at point D. Okay. Now the moment of F1 and F2 about this point are zero because these forces are passing through this point. So they will be having zero moment because there is no vertical component. Okay. Now if the body is in equilibrium, so what it means? It means that the sum of the moments of F1, F2 and F3 about any axis must be zero. So if there is some moment then it means that body is not in equilibrium so if body is equal is in equilibrium then the moments of these three forces about any axis must be zero so it follows that moment of f3 about d must be zero as well because the moment of these forces is zero because they are intersecting at this point so that means that the moment of F3 should also be 0 and the moment of F3 about D0 means that F3 must pass through the same point D. Okay. So this means that the line of action of three forces must be concurrent. So this is the first condition of equilibrium of a three force body that the line of action of the three forces that is F1, F2 and F3 must be concurrent that is they should pass through the same point or parallel okay so that means that for a equilibrium of a rigid body in 3d six scalar equations are required because summation of f should be zero and summation of m should be zero so we have three components for each so that means that summation of fx fy and fz should be equal to zero similarly summation of mx my and mz should be zero that means that these equations can be solved for no more than six unknowns because six equations so we can solve them for six unknowns okay we generally represent reactions at supports or connections so, so the unknowns generally are reactions or connections at supports we can also write in the vector form so then we have only two equations summation of f is equal to zero and summation of moment about any point which you can also write as r cross f should be zero now as we have seen 
the reactions at supports and connections for 2D. Similarly, in this slide, the reactions at support and connections for a 3D structure are shown. So suppose if we are having this type of supports, a ball type of support or your body is placed on some frictionless surface, then there is only one reaction which is normal to the surface, the surface, okay. Similarly, if we are having some cable, so then we have tension force and the tension force will be in the line of the cable, okay. Now, suppose if you are having a roller type of support or say wheel on rail, so in that case, there are two components, okay. So that is, suppose this is uh, in this direction moving, suppose this is moving, initially moving in this direction, then we will be having the reactions at Fy and Fz, okay. And if the body is supported on some rough surface or in case of ball and socket joint, we will be having three unknown reaction forces. So this is how you can draw reactions for 3D bodies. Similarly, suppose you are having some universal joint type of structure. So again, you will be having three unknown forces plus a moment. Okay. Now for fixed support, you will be having three unknown forces plus three moments. Okay. So you will be having six unknown for the fixed support. <clears throat> Sometimes you come across with these problems. Okay. So hinge and bearing supporting. So in that case, you will be having two forces. So we will um, we will not consider the axis of this. Uh, okay. So we will be having F Y and F Z. Similarly, M Y and M Z. And now for this type of forces, pin and bracket joint and hinge and bearing supporting axial thrust and radial load we will be having two moments m y and m z okay because in the x direction this is moving okay so we will be we will not having m x otherwise we will be having all the reactions f y f x f y f z and m y and m z so you should remember this whenever you are drawing the supports so just remember this and whenever you see so suppose you got in your problem this type of support then you can immediately draw these reactions now consider this problem problem is the uniform 7 meter steel shaft has a mass of 200 kg as you can see this is the steel shaft and is supported by a ball and socket joint at A. So here we are having a ball and socket joint. Okay. The ball and B rest against the smooth vertical walls. So other end is resting on these walls. Compute the forces exerted by the walls and the floor on the ends of the shaft. <coughs> So this is the free body diagram. So at the ball and socket joint, as we have seen, there should be three unknown reactions. Okay. While at uh, this, there should be two unknown reactions, Bx and By. Okay. So there will be no reaction at Bz, as we have seen in the previous slides. Now this is the solution of this problem. So weight we can calculate m into g and this distance okay and this unknown distance h you can calculate by simply applying the formula so we know this distance we know these three distances okay so this h height comes out to be three meters now this position vector r a g because this is our origin okay this is our origin okay so this is a and this is g so r a g will be minus 1 i 
So in x direction, this is 1. Similarly, minus 3j plus 1.5k. Similarly, we can calculate rab, which will be minus 2i minus 6j and plus 3k. Now, suppose you want to calculate moment about A. So, for equilibrium summation of all the moments about A should be 0. So, R A B cross B X plus B Y means the moments of this because of B Y X and B Y should be 0. Plus this moment because of this force W should also be zero. So we have R A B cross B X plus B Y plus R A G cross W should be zero. Okay, so this we have already calculated. Uh, sorry, R A B and B X and B Y they are unknown. Similarly, so R A G this we have calculated and w we have calculated now you can write this in the form of determinant so ijk minus 2 minus 6 3 and bx by and b that is 0 similarly we can write for this so our final equation will be this now equating the coefficients of i j and k to be 0 we will get bx as 654 newton and by as 1962 newton. Similarly, the summation of all the forces should also be 0. So, we can have summation of fx is equal to 0, summation of fy is equal to 0, summation of fz should be 0. So, this is x, this is y, and this is z. So, by solving the equations, these three equations, we will get AX as 654 Newton, AY as 1962 Newton, and AZ as 1962 Newton. So, finally, we can calculate A as under root AX square plus AY square plus AZ square. That means 654 square, 1962 square plus 1962 square. So, that will be 2850 Newton. So this completes the problem. So this is all for this video. Thanks for watching. Friction is both problematic and useful in many applications. So whenever there are some moving parts like in IC engine, piston and cylinder, they have relative motion, similarly journal and bearings. So in that case, we want less friction so that we have less losses. Although friction is also useful in many applications like it is helpful for you in the walking process. When you walk, then you need friction. It is very difficult to walk on a slippery surface. Then when you are writing on the board with the help of a chalk then again friction is useful then for braking purposes then if you want to pull some water from the well and for placing a ladder against a wall so these are some of the applications where friction is useful now let us introduce in previous chapters of mechanics we assumed that the surfaces were either frictionless or rough okay so in when the surface are frictionless surface could move freely with respect to each other and when they are rough tangential forces prevent relative motion between surfaces now actually no perfectly frictionless surface exists so however smooth the surface may be it has some friction for two surfaces in contact tangential forces are called as friction and they will develop when one attempts to move one surface relative to another 
Now the frictional forces are limited in magnitude and will not prevent motion if sufficiently large forces are applied. So whenever you apply some small force, then your body will not move. Well. When you apply large forces, then body starts to move. So frictional forces they cannot prevent motion. Now the distinction between frictionless and rough is therefore a matter of degree. Okay. So if the force is very large, so you can say that the surface is frictionless. And if you are applying very small force, then for the same surface, you can say that that uh, this surface is rough. Now there are two types of friction dry which is also called as coulomb friction and fluid friction <clears throat> now fluid friction applies to lubricated mechanism or in many applications in engineering you are doing lubrication okay so there you are using fluid friction now the present discussion is limited to dry friction so in our course of mechanics we will only deal with dry friction we will discuss laws of dry friction so as you can see suppose um, this block is placed on the surface so we will have two forces one force is in the downward direction because of the weight and another is the reaction of the surface now if you apply some force on the block in the horizontal direction okay but suppose that force is small so that this block will not move so it means that there must be some opposite force to this f so that uh, this block is not moving and that force is the force of static friction okay now if you continue to increase this force this force will also increase frictional force will also increase but uh, a point is reached when uh, this force will become maximum and uh, then this block will just start to move okay so this maximum force this is called as the static friction and when this block just start to move then this force is called as kinematic friction okay and this kinematic friction force is slightly less than the maximum static friction force so maximum static friction force is fm is equal to mu s into n while this kinematic friction force is equals to mu k into n where the value of mu k is slightly less than mu s and there is mu s and mu k they are also called as coefficients of friction so this is how this friction force works now this uh, in this table some of the coefficients of friction values are shown so suppose metal is placed on metal then this value of mu s varies from 0.15 to 0.6 Similarly, if metal is placed on wood, then this value is 0.2 to 0.6. Similarly, you can see other values. So, for example, if rubber is placed on concrete, then this value is very high and it is varies from 0.6 to 0.9. Okay. And uh, as we know, this kinetic friction force is slightly lower. Uh, then the static friction so approximately it is around 75 percent of the static friction force now maximum static friction force and kinetic friction force are proportional to normal force so from this law you can say that these forces are proportional to the normal reaction force okay and they depend on type and condition of contact surfaces because this value of mu s it changes with the surface okay so there are two variables n and mu s so the force frictional force will depend on the reaction and the 
two surfaces which are in contact while it is independent of the contact area because in this equation there is no term related to area so we can say that the frictional force is independent of the contact area now there are four situations that can occur when a rigid body is in contact with a horizontal surface so let us see those four conditions so this is the first condition when this force is applied from the top okay so uh, in this case we have the weight we have the normal force and since it is applied from the top and block cannot move in the bottom direction because of this restrain okay so we can say that in that case frictional force is zero now second condition is that when this force is in applied at certain angle okay now we can reduce this force in two components px and py and in that case there will be some frictional force and uh, suppose there is no motion then this px will be less than f because f will be equals to px and f is less than mu s by n now n is equal to py plus w because this one component will act to, with w to counter this n okay so n will be equals to py plus w now the third condition is that motion is impending means motion is just about to start okay so that we call it motion is impending okay in that case this fx will be equals to fm and the fourth condition is the motion when this force uh, is such that it imparts motion to this block so in that case px is greater than the frictional force so when there is no motion then px is less than the frictional force when motion is just about to start then this the applied force is equal to the frictional force and the, when the motion is started then applied force is greater than the frictional force fields of friction so sometimes it is convenient to replace normal force and the frictional force by their resultant okay so this is the first case in this we have no friction so the resultant force will be equals to the normal force now in the second case we can represent the normal force n and this frictional force f by their resultant r and this is the angle between the normal and resultant force and this is the angle is the phi okay similarly in the third case when the motion is impending then again we can find the resultant r and in that case we call this phi is equal to phi s and this is the angle of static friction okay and uh, you can find by using the tan law tan phi s will be equals to fm by n which is equals to mu s n by n and so tan phi s will be equals to mu s okay so that's coefficient of static friction we can find by taking the value of tangent of this angle similarly when motion starts then we call this angle phi is equal to phi k and this tan phi k will be equals to mu k now to better understand this angle of friction consider a weight resting on board with variable inclination theta so this is a weight and this is resting on the this board and this board has a variable inclination so suppose initially it has inclination zero so in that case there will be no friction now suppose uh, we move this board like this we are changing the inclination of this board so initially what happens there will be no motion okay now what we can do we can 
break the forces in the components so this force is w sin theta this force is w cos theta okay similarly we have n n will be equals to w cos theta because this will balance and f will be equals to w sin theta now at one point what happens if you continue to increase this angle that and one point what happens the motion is about to start okay so means motion is impending okay so in that case we call angle this theta is equal to theta as the angle of repose okay and this is equals to phi r which is the angle of friction and when the motion starts then this theta will be greater than theta s okay so when you are this theta means the angle of inclination of this uh, board is greater than theta s then this motion will start so on the problems involving drive friction so sometimes you have this type of case where all applied forces are known coefficient of static friction is also known and you have to determine whether body will remain at rest or slide okay so sometimes you have to solve these type of problems then another case might be all applied forces are known and motion is about to start motion is impending and you have to determine the value of coefficient of static friction that is you need to find the mu s so in that case first case you need to calculate the frictional force okay in the second case you need to calculate the mu s and in the third case the body is moving so coefficient of static friction is known motion is impending and you have to determine magnitude or direction of one of the applied forces so you may need to find the direction of p magnitude of p or any other applied force so this is how you can solve the problems involving dry friction one simple problem so consider this block on this inclined plane and in this block a 100 pound force is applied the coefficients are given mu s is equals to 0.25 and mu k is equal to 0.2 now we have to determine whether the block is in equilibrium and find the value of frictional force so these are the steps first we will draw the free body diagram okay and remember that the friction force is opposite to the direction of impending motion so in whichever direction you uh, uh, know that the block will move so then you will apply the force frictional force in the opposite of that then next step is to determine values of friction force and normal reaction force from plane required to maintain equilibrium so we will suppose that the uh, suppose the body is in equilibrium and then we will calculate the frictional forces and normal reaction required for equilibrium and the, what we will do next we will calculate the maximum friction force maximum friction force can be calculated from fm is equal to, fs is equal to mu s into n okay so we will calculate the maximum friction force okay so if it is greater block will not slide so friction force is greater then block will not slide and if friction, maximum friction force is less than the friction force required for equilibrium block will slide okay so we will calculate the forces for maintaining equilibrium and we will calculate the maximum frictional force so if maximum friction force is less than the friction force for equilibrium then block will slide otherwise it will not so let us solve the problem so this is the free body diagram of the problem so this uh, weight will act vertically downward and uh, 
n is per normal to the surface and uh, this is the applied force and suppose um, because force is applied in this direction so we are supposing that the motion will be in this direction so the frictional force will be opposite to this so the friction force will be in this direction okay <clears throat> so now suppose we are supposing the equilibrium then for equilibrium summation of fx will be zero summation of fy will be zero so suppose this is our x direction okay so in the x direction we have this force applied force then we have one component of this uh, weight and then we have the friction force so from friction force from this we can find f is minus 80 pound okay similarly we can calculate f y so in the y direction which is this direction okay this one so we have n then we have one component of this weight so n minus 4 by 5 of 300 pound so n will be equals to 240 pound so these are the conditions for equilibrium okay now sign means that this force is opposite okay now we can calculate the maximum frictional force with this formula okay so now we know the n <coughs> and mu s is given in the problem so fm is the 60 pound okay so now your maximum frictional force is less than this force so that means the block will move okay because this force is less than the force so that means the block will slide down the plane okay So now if maximum friction force is less than the friction force required for equilibrium, block will slide. So actually now since block is sliding, okay. So now the frictional force will not be equal to the maximum friction force, but it will be equal to the uh, kinetic friction, okay. So we need to calculate the kinetic friction. So kinetic friction will be equals to fk is equal to mu k into n and fk is 0.2 given the problem 240 we know so actual friction force will be 48 pound okay so this is how you can solve the problems involving friction first we will learn so they are simple machines so this is wedge C and D they are forming a wedge okay so these are the simple machines that can be used to lift the weights and uh, in these machines force required to lift the blocks are significantly less than its weight okay and the friction force prevents wedge from sliding out so it will not slide out because of the friction force and we want to find the force value of this force that is required to raise the weight for that what we do we will first draw the free body diagram of this body <coughs> so in this body we have the force of weight now since when we apply this force till this block will move in the upward direction so we will have the frictional force towards the downward direction f1 is equal to mu s n1 and also we have one normal force okay similarly we have a normal force at this horizontal surface plus this uh, block will try to move in this direction okay so frictional force will be opposite so another friction force will be f2 is equal to mu s n2 now what we can do we can uh, for equilibrium we can equate the fx is equal to 0 fy is equal to 0 so in the x direction we have 
minus n1 plus mu s n2 will be equals to 0 and in the y direction we have minus w minus mu s n1 plus n2 is equal to 0 or we can also write in the form of resultant so we can find r2 we can find r1 and we can write in the vector form r1 plus r2 plus w should be equals to 0 similarly we can draw the free body diagram of this wedge so in which this wedge we have this force f now there are the reaction forces which will act on the top portion so here we have n2 so here we have minus n2 similarly here we have f2 so we have a reaction force minus f2 and now <clears throat> these are the frictional forces which will act towards the bottom side of the wedge so we have one normal force n3 which is normal to this surface okay so this is normal to this surface and similarly since we are applying a force in this direction so we have some opposite frictional force f3 which will be equals to mu s n3 okay so again we do the same thing we can have fx is equal to zero summation of fx is equal to zero that will give us mu s n2 because this is in the x direction now there is some inclination of uh, because we have six degree of angle so this n3 is bit inclined okay so we will be having a some angle here okay so we will have some components so we can write that so we have n3 mu s cos 6 plus sin 6 okay and plus p that will be in x direction okay Similarly, in the y direction, we have minus n2 plus n3 cos 6 minus mu s sin 6. So, we can find the components of both the forces in the x and y directions. And we can also write in the form of a vector. So, we have P R2. The resultant of these forces are R2. Similarly, the resultant of these forces R3. So P minus R2 plus R3 is equal to 0. So this is how we can deal with the wedges. Example of friction is the self-threaded screws. This is the figure of self-threaded screws. And these square threaded screws, they are frequently used in jacks, presses, etc. And their analysis can be performed similar to the block in, on an inclined plane. Okay. And uh, we are using the principle that friction force does not depend on area of contact. So we have represented this screw with this plane. Okay. So one of the thread of the base has been unwrapped and it is shown as a straight line that is equal to 2 pi r <coughs> and the distance which is moved in one rotation which is equal to L is shown in vertical okay and this is the weight W and we have shown the, the this force Q which is equal to the force p that is necessary for uh, lifting any weight if you want to lift any weight then you will apply force p so this force q is in is such that the moment of force q is equal to the moment of force p that is q should be equals to p into a divided by r okay so if we calculate q then this force q will be equal to p okay now there is a one case which is also called a self locking case so that case will occur when uh, this angle theta s is greater than the angle theta so in that case what happens if you put some weight on this uh, Mm. screw 
or in on this jack so it will not move downward so that is that means that it is self locking okay so in that case we have to apply force to lower the weight okay so this condition will occur when this angle phi s is greater than theta okay and then you need to solve for q to lower the load <coughs> and then there is another case in which where you put on the load so it will automatically try to unwind and lower the load so in that case you have to apply the force in the opposite direction so that the weight do not come downward so that will occur when phi s means the angle between the resultant and normal is less than the angle this angle theta okay so in that case you have to solve for the force q to hold this weight so that it will not come down automatically so this is how we can solve the problems that are related with the square threaded screws that are frequently used in jacks and presses now we will solve this problem related to square threaded screws so as you can see in this figure a clamp is used to hold two pieces of wood together so these are the two pieces of wood as shown and this is the clamp and this clamp has a double square thread of mean diameter 10 mm and the pitch of this thread is 2 mm okay. coefficient of friction between threads is 0.3 now if a maximum torque of 40 newton meter is applied in tightening the clamp determine the force exerted on the piece of the foot <coughs> and the second part the torque required to loosen the clamp so this is the problem first we will calculate the lead angle and pitch angle and uh, then by block and plane analogy as uh, discussed with impending motion up the plane calculate the clamping force with a force triangle so we will make a force triangle and we will calculate the clamping force and then with impending motion down the plane we will calculate the force required to loosen the now we have made uh, this diagram uh, so in this diagram this uh, this is the weight w and first we are considering the up means suppose we are tightening the screw so for that we need to uh, up force means the force which is applied in the up direction so now for calculating the lead and pitch angle for double threaded screw the lead is equal to twice the pitch okay so pitch is given 2 mm so we will take lead as 4 mm so this L is equal to 4 mm and uh, this uh, length <coughs> in the horizontal direction will be 2 pi r as we have already discussed so that will be 10 pi because r is 5 so from the figure you can see that 10 theta will be equals to L divided by 2 pi r so from that you can calculate the lead angle lead angle is when you take the inverse of this the lead angle will be 7.3 degree and uh, on this angle for static friction 10 phi s you will be equal to mu s and it is given as 0.3 already in the problem so then this phi s will be 16.7 degree okay now block and plane analogy with impending motion will be like this so we will make the force triangle so w is downward q is on the right side and then r will complete the triangle so now this q r is 40 newton meter it is already given in the problem 
so r you know then from this you can calculate q that will comes out to be 8 kilo newton and uh, now this angle is 24 degree so because this is 7.3 and 16.7 when you add this that will become 24 so now this then theta plus phi s will be q by w so you can calculate w which is comes out to be 17.97 kilometer sorry kilo newton now for calculating the force to loosen of the screw now this time we assume the q in this direction because you need q in this direction to loosen so again we will make the force triangle so w and this time q will be in this direction and r will be in this direction so now then theta uh, then phi s minus theta will be q by w and then q comes out to be 2.975 kilo newton and torque you can calculate by multiplying the r that will be equals to 14.87 newton meter so as you can see there there's uh, this is considerably lower while tightening the screw you need 8 kilo newton while you're loosening we only need 2.975 kilo newton so the force required is different for tightening and loosening the screw so suppose and uh, this is a belt passing through the pulley so we will discuss what will be the frictional force that will act when is uh, this belt is about to slide so suppose the tension here is t1 and tension here is t2 and these p1 and p2 are the points of uh, tangential contact between the belt and pulley so first thing we will do is to make the free body diagram of the element so we will consider this element <coughs> this element and uh, the free body diagram of this element has been drawn here so as you can say suppose here on the left side we are having a ten, ten side, uh, sorry tension force of t and uh, suppose on the right side we are having a tension force t plus delta t and this reaction force will be in the vertical direction delta n and this frictional force will be the, from the law of static friction mu s delta n okay so this is the free body diagram now from the free body diagram <coughs> summation of fx will be equal to zero so in the x direction we have t plus delta t cos theta by 2 so this angle is theta by 2 and the component of this force will be here like this okay similarly we have minus t cos theta by 2 and minus this is the frictional force which is also in the x direction similarly you can write for y delta n this is the force and we will have two components one is this and another is here so our equation becomes this okay now what we can do we can suppose we can solve for delta n from equation this and we can put in the second equation then finally you will obtain this equation divide and <coughs> you when you further divide by delta t then this is your final equation so <coughs> delta t by delta theta cos delta theta by 2 minus mu s t plus del t by 2 into sine del theta by 2 divided by del theta by 2 okay now when suppose if delta theta is very small then this term becomes 1 because cos 0 is 1 so so when delta theta approaches 0 this term becomes d t by d theta and also you can also neglect delta t because as delta theta approaches 0 so this delta t will also be negligible 
this will be zero and uh, for a small values this sine del theta by 2 will be approximately equal to del theta by 2 and which will cancel out so finally we get this equation d theta by sorry dt by d theta minus mu s t so this is our differential equation you can easily solve this by using the variable separate uh, separable method and you can integrate it from theta is equal to 0 theta is equal to beta <coughs> Because your angle is changing, maximum angle is this beta, and minimum angle, minimum possible angle is zero. So when you solve this equation, the solution will be ln t2 by t1 is equal to mu s beta, and we can also write t2 by t1 is equal to e mu s beta. So this is the solution of this equation and this is equation covers the belt friction okay problem related to belt. So here you can see a flat belt connects pulley a to pulley b so this is the pulley a and this is the pulley b and this belt connects both the pulleys the coefficient of friction are mu s is equal to 0.25 static friction and kinetic friction is 0 0.20 between both pulleys knowing that the maximum allowable tension is uh, 600 pound so maximum allowable tension is this determine the largest torque which can be exerted by the belt on pulley so this is our problem now how we are going to solve this so this is the strategy the key to solving this problem is to identify the pulley where slippage would first occur first by our knowledge we should identify which on which pulley slippage can occur and then find the corresponding belt tensions when the slippage is impending as we have done in the previous equation the resistance to slippage depends upon the angle of contact beta as well as upon the coefficient of static frictions now this mu is same for both the pulleys slippage occurs first on pulley b for which beta is smaller so the chances of slippage will be more on a smaller pulley so now let us solve this problem diagram on the first pulley uh, as we done during the derivation so this is T1, T2 is given maximum 600 pound and this is the solution which we have already obtained T2 by T1 is equal to E mu s beta. So from this we can obtain T1 as 355.4 pound. Now let us make the balance on bigger pulley. So this is the free body diagram of the big pulley so by summing the moments about a we have m a and we will have the moments because of these two tension forces t1 and t2 and this 8 inch is the diameter of the pulley so m a plus 8 and this is the resultant of the these tension forces so finally <laughs> the moment comes out to be 163.1 pound foot now for the solution we can check that the belt does not slip on pulley a you can also check it by computing the value of mu s required to prevent the slipping at a and then verifying it with the value of mu s okay so now applying this equation for second pulley mu s beta and this so um, this comes out to be 0.524 mu s beta now this beta for bigger pulley is 240 degree which is 4 pi by 3 newtons so from this we can calculate mu s and mu s comes out to be 0.125 which is much much smaller than 
the frictional force maximum friction 0.25 so you can see that the slippage would not occur on the pulley a so this is the first problem related to friction so the problem is determine whether the block shown is in equilibrium and find the magnitude and direction of the friction force so we have to find out whether this block is in equilibrium and we have to find the magnitude and direction of the friction force when this angle theta is equal to 25 degree and this applied force is equal to 725 newton so let us solve this problem first of all we have to draw the free body diagram so suppose this is your body okay so i will make the block and so this is your block suppose and let us consider the x axis in this direction and y direction you know, y axis is in the normal direction to this plane okay so this is our y axis this is our x axis and uh, the forces which are acting are the weight force and this is equal to 1.25 kilo newton then this force is acting uh, acting p which is 750 newton and uh, <coughs> normal force will act perpendicular to this n okay normal force and uh, suppose uh, this uh, force p this pushes the block in this direction so the frictional force will act in the opposite means to resist the motion so this will be the frictional force okay now we can resolve these forces into the x and y directions this force w and this force p so for that we need the angles so this angle is given theta which is equals to 25 degree okay so we have suppose this is the perpendicular this is the y direction okay and uh, we have this is the perpendicular okay so this is uh, this line is perpendicular to this line and this line is perpendicular to horizontal okay so this angle will be theta similarly you can find for this so this is the horizontal okay so in the y direction um, let us draw this so again uh, this angle will be theta okay so according to equilibrium summation of fx will be zero and summation of fy will be zero now in the x direction we have w sin theta then this uh, <coughs> and this will be here okay and this p force will act in the opposite direction so we can say minus 750 
cos theta and uh, frictional force okay f will be equal to zero and similarly in the y direction we will be having w cos theta which is downward minus n and we have the <coughs> one component this plus 750 sin theta plus 2 0 so we just need to solve the two equations then we will get f as 172 172.6 newton and n you can calculate from the second equation that will be comes out to be 1404 1404.5 newton okay and uh, maximum frictional force maximum will be equal to mu s into n which will equal to now mu s is 0.35 given here into 1404.5 so maximum friction force is friction so this is our problem there are two blocks and they are attached with a cable and this force is applied so we are given coefficients of friction static as well as kinetic and we have to determine the force p required to start the motion of this 30 kg block okay when this cable is attached and the second part when this cable is uh, removed okay so let us start so first we will do the first part part a so let us make the free body diagram okay so first we will make the free body diagram of 20 kg block so in this we have uh, w then we have a force of tension then suppose this block will move in this direction then we have friction force here and we have a normal force okay now according to equilibrium w will be equal to n which will be equals to 20 into 9.81 which will be equal to 196 point um, 196.2 newton okay point 0.2 newton similarly uh, we can equate uh, this is summation fy and uh, summation of fx should also be zero that means this uh, t should be equal to f okay now f you can calculate f will be equal to mu s into n and mu s is 0 0.4 while n is 196.2 okay so that comes out to be 78.48 78.48 newton and thus we will get t is equal to 78.48 newton okay now we will draw the free body diagram for block 2 so in this we have a reaction force which is equal and opposite to this then uh, there is a friction force f which is equal and opposite to this force okay now we have uh, weight of this block okay then we have a tension force here we have p here okay 
and another friction force let's say f2 will be here okay and then we have a normal reaction force n2 so again we will make the equilibrium condition so summation of f y is equal to zero so in the f we will be having a weight uh, plus n that should be equals to n2 okay so weight is equal to 30 into 9.81 plus uh, we know this n 196.2 so this will be equals to n2 so it comes out to be n2 will be equal to 490.5 newton okay 490.5 newton similarly you can equate the uh, summation of fx in the x direction though that should also be equal to zero so you know this p force should be equal to t plus f and plus f2 okay so this t we have calculated 78.48 f we have calculated again 78.48 and this f2 will be equal to uh, mu s n2 mu s n2 so mu s we know uh, 0.4 and n2 we know uh, 490.5 so from this uh, we can solve for p and it comes out to be 353.2 newton 353.2 newton so this is the smallest force which is required for the motion of block b when the cable is attached okay now second part is a little simpler one b part okay so let us solve the B part uh, here. Okay. So free body diagram. So in, when this cable is detached, then this will act as a single body. Uh, so free body diagram will be like this. So you will be having both the blocks moving together. Okay. So we have a vertically downward force of W. Uh, then a reaction force N and suppose this is moving in this direction P so we have a friction force here so these are the two forces okay now W will be equals to means total of this so 50 into 9.81 that comes out to be 490 Point 0.5 newton okay and then p minus f will be equal to zero in the x direction so p will be equal to f which is equals to mu s into n that will be equal to 0.4 into 490.5 and when we solve it so it comes out to be 196.2 newton welcome dear students so this is problem of friction so the problem is knowing that the coefficient of static friction between the collar so this is the collar c and the rod is 0 0.35 determine the range of values of p so this is the applied force P. So we have to find out the range of values of P for which equilibrium is maintained. When this angle theta is equal to 50 degree and M this applied couple is 20 Newton per meter. So now let us solve this problem. <coughs> So 
so solution i am writing solution so first i will draw the free body diagram of this rod a b so this is the rod a b so in this rod we will be having reactions here so you can call it a x a y and then we have a force here sorry yes so this force uh, we will have and the direction of this force is this okay so let us call it f b c okay so what we can do for equilibrium we can take the moment about a and it should be equal to zero so then we have m and uh, we can break this force fbc into two components one component will be here and one component will be here so the moment because of this vertical component will be zero so we will have only this and this moment is opposite to this so we can write it minus fbc cos theta is equal to zero okay so now this is 20 fbc and this is 50 degree equal to zero and this will give us f b c so the value of f b c comes out to be three one one point four five newton okay now second thing we will we do what we will do we will make the free body diagram of color C now, there are two conditions one condition can be motion impending upward and motion impending downward so let us consider first case motion impending downward okay So we have this force P. That if motion is impending downward, then friction force will act here. And this friction force will be mu s into n. And we will be having n normal. And then we have this force F V C and this angle is 50 degree 50 so now we have all the forces that are acting on the collar so we can have for equilibrium summation of fx is equal to zero that means f bc cos 50 degree uh, minus n will be equal to zero so from this we can get n so the value of n comes out to be 200 newton <coughs> then we have summation of f y is equal to zero so in the y direction we have p acting downward then f b c sine 50 degree so the component of this force okay and uh, minus frictional force and this is the frictional force f uh, so we can directly write it uh, so just a minute so mu s is given as 0 0.35 so mu s into 
n which is we already get 200 equal to 0 so from this we know the value of this fbc so we can get the value of p which comes out to be 168.35 newton now second scenario can be when this scholar is impending upward okay so fbd of collar c motion impending upward so again the diagram will remain same so here we will have fbc 50 degree f bc then we have p and friction force will again will act downward so this is the friction force again mu s n and here we will have n okay <coughs> so again summation of f x is equal to zero summation of f y is equal to zero so well, this equation will remain same now in the y we have p uh, minus f b c sine 50 degree and this time this will be plus 0.35 into 200 into 0 and this from this we can get p is equal to the value of p comes out to be 308.35 newton so we have to find the range of p for which this is in equilibrium so p will be in this range 168.35 and then p then 308.35 so this is the final answer we will write in this range so this is how we can welcome dear students so now we will solve another problem related to friction and this problem is related to wedges so the problem is two wedges of 10 degree and uh, negligible weight are used to move and position this block okay knowing that the coefficient of static friction is 0 0.25 at all surfaces of contact determine the smallest force p that should be applied as shown to one of the wedges so we have to find the value of p so let us solve the problem <coughs> So, first we will calculate phi s and that will be equals to 10 of 20.25 and it comes out to be 14. 0.04 degree okay now next we will draw the free body diagram of block so suppose we are drawing it here okay so first force is the weight of this block then we have n 
normal reaction. Okay. And then we have the friction force. Suppose F1. Then we have the normal reaction here. So you can call it N2. And friction force here. I can replace these forces by the resultant so we can have R1 and this angle is phi s similarly you will have R2 the resultant of F2 and this angle is again phi s okay now what we can do for, uh, if the block is in equilibrium then all these three forces should uh, form a force triangle. So we can make a force triangle and then we can apply the sine law. Okay. So this is the force triangle. So the force this is the W. Uh, then we are having R1 and R2. So suppose this is R1. And then this should close this R2. Okay, now the, this angle we know phi s. And uh, this angle is known to us. This is again uh, phi s. So we need to find the other angles also. So this angle will be 90 degree minus 2 times of phi s. So this is just a geometry, you can work out it, it's not a big problem. So this comes out to be 61.9. And uh, then you can apply the triangle law, so you can find this angle also. So this angle will be 90 plus 5s. Because up to this we are having 90, okay. And this 5s is plus, so this angle will be 104, okay. Point zero four. And this angle we have calculated by the triangle law. <coughs> now we can apply sine law. So by using sine law, uh, we can have W upon sine of say, 61 degree, 61.92. Okay, 61.9 this value, and then we can have R2, uh, R2 upon 104. So, sine of uh, just a minute, sine of 104.4 degree, sorry, 04. So from that you can calculate R2 and it's come down to be 439.8 pound. Okay. Now next step we will draw the free body diagram. Free body diagram of wedge so this is your wedge
Okay, so we will have R2 on top, we will have R2. Okay, then we have a P and uh, we will have R3 here. So I'm not showing the friction forces separately this time. So we will have R3 and uh, this angle is 14 degree, right? And uh, this angle we have. 10 because the wedge angle is 10 so 10 plus phi s okay now what we can do we can make a force triangle for this so suppose p is here then we can have r2 here and then this should be r3 And the angle uh, comes out to be so we need to find these angles. So this angle will be means uh, uh, fourteen plus ten plus fourteen, so twenty-eight uh, means this angle is around. 41.04 plus 24.04 so from 38.08 degree so this angle will be this <coughs> and uh, we need to find other angles also so uh, this angle will be 90 degree so 90 degree minus of 24.04 okay now we can apply sine law in this triangle also so from the sine law we get p upon sine of this 38.08 and that will be equals to r2 upon because we have already calculated r2 so r2 upon sine of this 90 minus 24.04 so from this since we know r2 this is the R2, so we can calculate P, and the value of P comes out to be 297.297 pound. So, this is the main. So, what is principle of virtual work? It uh, says that if a particle or a rigid body or system of rigid bodies which is in equilibrium under various forces is given an arbitrary virtual displacement then the net work done by the external forces during this that displacement is zero <coughs> okay so a particle or a rigid body or a system of rigid bodies when they are in equilibrium okay so suppose if we are giving some virtual displacement so because uh, uh, there is no actual displacement that means the network done by the external force during that displacement is zero and this principle is particularly useful when applied to the solution of problems involving the equilibrium of machines or mechanism that consist of several connected members okay and if a particle rigid body or system of rigid bodies is in equilibrium then the derivative of its potential energy 
with respect to the variable defining its position is zero okay so now let us understand the work of a force so suppose this is the force okay which is applied at point a and suppose this particle under the action of this force moves to another point a dash and these r is the initial position vector of the particle and r plus dr is the final position vector while this dr is the displacement vector then the work of this force will be given as f dot dr means for dot product of the force and displacement and which we uh, can also write as du is equal to f ds cos alpha as you already know how to open the dot product now there are some situations when the both force and uh, displacement is in the same direction that means alpha is equal to zero then this work is simply equal to the product of f into ds okay while if this alpha is equal to pi that means the force and the displacement is in the opposite direction that usually happens with the weight force which is uh, because of the gravity so in that case the w uh, work is d is equal to minus f dot ds okay and if alpha is equal to pi by 2 means the force applied okay and uh, displacement they are perpendicular to each other means they have the 90 degree angle so as we know that cos 90 is 0 so that means the work is 0 so this is very important whenever the force and displacement they are perpendicular to each other then the work done will be 0 okay so now we will discuss uh, some important forces which do no work so first one is the reaction at a frictionless pin due to a rotation of a body around the pin okay so this force reaction at the frictionless pin will do no work because there is no lateral motion only rotation is there so this force will do no work second reaction at a frictionless surface due to motion of a body along the surface so because this is causing a perpendicular arrangement okay because reaction at the frictionless surface is always perpendicular and suppose this is the body okay and body is moving in this direction so we can say that this is angle is 90 degree okay so whenever the force and displacement is 90 degree then the work is zero so in this case also the work is zero Similarly, weight, <coughs> weight of a body with CG moving horizontally. So, in this case also, the weight which is uh, act vertically downward while the center of gravity is moving horizontally. So, again, both the forces and displacement, they are perpendicular to each other and there will be a no work. Then, friction force on a wheel moving without slipping. So again in this case, suppose this is the wheel and it is moving without slipping, okay. So the friction force will be always uh, opposite to the motion and uh, this is the motion of the wheel. So they always, they are, they will always be perpendicular to each other. So again there will be no work, okay. Again, sum of work done by several forces may be zero apart from these conditions when bodies are connected by a frictionless pin. So, as in this case, these two bodies AC and BC, they are connected by a frictionless pin. <coughs> so, 
So there will be two forces, F and minus F. So if suppose if this force is doing a positive work and so then the work of this force is negative and both the works add up to zero. Okay. Similarly, body is connected by an inextensible cord as in this case. So again, so suppose if this is doing positive work, so then this will do negative work, then both the work will be overall the work will be zero. Similarly, third case is internal forces holding together parts of a rigid body. So suppose this is the rigid body and uh, these are the two points A and B and uh, we are having forces F and minus F. So these are the internal forces. So again, if we see from the external, there is no force. So in this case also, the work of these forces, internal forces will be zero. Now let us see the work of a couple. Okay, so again consider the rigid body and suppose these are the two points F, A and B and the couple is acting on AB. So suppose this is F, this is minus F. So under the action of the couple, there are two type of motions, translation motion from AB to A dash B dash. Okay, and rotation of B dash about A dash to B double dash. Okay, so under the action of the couple, um, these two points A and B, they move to A dash and B double dash. And we can divide it into two parts, translational motion plus rotational motion. Okay, so now this, uh, the translational motion, this will cancel out. So well, suppose we have minus F dot dr and plus F dot dr, so this will cancel out. And finally, the work which will remain is only F dot dr2, okay, and which has nothing will uh, but F ds2, which will be equals to F r d theta. So if this is the vector r, so this is the distance r and this is angle d theta, then r d theta will be equal to dr2 and F into r is nothing but the moment. So work from a couple, we can say that will be equal to moment into the angular rotation of the body m d theta. So this is very simple. We can calculate the work of a couple by this expression w is equal to m d theta. Now what uh, principle of virtual work says? So imagine a virtual displacement of particles which are acted upon by several forces. Suppose multiple forces are acting on the body. So the corresponding virtual work will be F1 dot delta R plus F2 dot delta R plus F3 dot delta R. So we will consider the work from every force and then you will add that. So we will get the total corresponding virtual work. So now this expression we can write like this. We can take delta del r dot as common. Then the work will be f1 plus f2 plus f3 dot delta r. And we can write the resultant of this. So the work will be r dot delta r. Now there are some points related to principle of virtual work. First is if a particle is in equilibrium, the total virtual work of forces acting on the particle is zero because the particle is in equilibrium it is not moving so that means the total virtual work should be zero okay and if a rigid body is in equilibrium the total virtual work of external forces acting on the body is zero for any virtual displacement of the body so if any rigid body is in equilibrium then what we will do we will calculate the virtual work and then we will equate it to zero and then we will can then we can calculate any unknown quantity and the third point is if a system of connected rigid bodies remain connected during the virtual displacement only work of the external forces need to be considered if there is some displacement in a rigid body which is connected and there are several rigid bodies which are connected. 
so we will consider the displacement only because of the external forces now how you can apply the application in this principle of virtual work so suppose this is a body and uh, there are two rigid bodies actually ac and bc and suppose this p is the external force which is acting and this this is the initial angle uh, between this line and the rigid body is theta now the force under this uh, force uh, this body deform in this shape so that this angle and uh, this change in angle is delta theta <coughs> and uh, this uh, vertical movement in the vertical direction is delta yc and uh, movement in this x uh, axial direction is delta xb okay so under the action of this forces and these reaction forces these are the movements so now you can calculate the virtual work so virtual work will be delta uq okay plus means uh, because of the force p plus delta up because of the force p okay so these p force and q force they will do work and this is because uh, this is the frictionless spin so and uh, the rotation motion is there so this these forces will do no work okay now work because of the q will be under the action q this is the displacement and uh, both are in the opposite direction so this work is minus q delta xb and again uh, uh, this work is p delta yc because this yc is negative so minus yc okay now we can write the expressions for xb so this xb is nothing but uh, 2l sin theta because, because this part up to this point uh, sorry up to this point is l sin theta plus l sin theta so this xb will be equal to 2x uh, 2l sin theta and then we can differentiate it then delta x will be uh, 2l cos theta delta theta similarly for, uh, exp you can write expression for yc so yc, YC is l cos theta and then we can differentiate uh, delta yc is minus l sin theta delta theta so now we can put these expression in this equation so final equation of delta work uh, sorry virtual work is minus 2ql cos theta delta theta plus pl sin theta del theta and from this we can get the expression q is equal to half of p tan theta okay so if we know this value of p then we can calculate q or if we know q we can calculate p so this is how we can do the problems related to virtual work so first of all we will calculate the work of a force during a finite displacement so as you already know that uh, if a force is acting on any particle or a rigid body and there is some small displacement uh, dr then the work is equal to f dot dr this we already know and we can write is f ds cos alpha okay now suppose this is your element okay so uh, suppose it is the uh, initial position is this and uh, ds is the small dist uh, distance through which this uh, element moves because of the action of this force now work for a finite displacement uh, from point a1 so this is the initial point a1 and this is the final point a2 okay so this work you can calculate by simply integrating it integrating this expression f ds cos alpha so f cos alpha ds from s1 to s2 okay so by simply integrating you can calculate the total work of which uh, this force do on this particle when this particle moves from point a1 to point a2 
and similarly you can calculate the work for the couple so if some couple is acting on any particle and because of that couple there is some rotation d theta uh, then the work is d is equal to m d, d theta and for a finite rotation the work will be m uh, integral of uh, theta 1 to theta 2 d theta and finally you will get m theta 2 minus theta now let us see the work of a force during finite displacement for some situations so consider this first situation when your particle is either moving up or moving down so this is called as work because of a weight okay so we know the work is equal to uh, because the small displacement is dy then small work du is equal to minus w dy and suppose this weight moves from point a1 to point a2 then the work during this finite displacement u12 will be integral of this w dy from minus uh, y1 to y2 and this work is negative because uh, both are in opposite direction displacement and uh, force now when you integrate it you can you can get this equation w y1 minus w y2 and which is equal to minus w delta y okay similarly suppose this is the spring so work of a spring so in the undefined form this is the undefined form of the spring and uh, suppose it is deformed slightly to x1 and uh, then spring force will also act in the opposite direction to this uh, deformation and suppose this is the final position okay so we know that du is equal to minus f into dx because they are in the opposite direction now spring force we know we can uh, write spring force uh, by this expression f is equal to kx so in this expression of work we can write kx dx and for this finite displacement we have x1 to x2 and when you integrate this then you will got half kx1 square minus half kx2 square okay so this is the work from a spring and this work can also be calculated uh, with the help of uh, this uh, diagram okay so suppose on the x-axis we have taken the displacement on the y-axis we have taken the applied uh, spring force sorry so then area can work can be calculated with the help of area under this curve okay and this curve this area will give you the work so the shaded portion will give you the total work which is nothing but minus 1 by 2 f1 plus f2 delta x so this is how you can calculate the work of a force during a finite displacement for certain situations Let us see about uh, the concept of potential energy. So we know that the work of a weight we calculated just recently that uh, work is equal to W y1 minus W y2. So from the expression we can see that the work is independent of the path and depends only on the initial and final position. Okay. So we can also know we also know that from our previous knowledge that this work into height it is also known as the potential energy of the body. Okay, <clears throat> so we can see that the work is equal to simply the change in potential energy. So this one is the potential energy at first location, and this expression will give you the potential energy at the second location so work through a finite displacement is also equal to the change in potential energy okay similarly the work of a spring 
we know this expression half k x1 square minus half k x2 square now this this one is the potential energy of this spring at position 1 and uh, this is the potential energy of the spring as position 2 so again we uh, see that work of a spring through a finite displacement is equal to the change in potential energy of the body with respect to the elastic force okay so this e represent the elastic okay and just g represent the force of gravity now when the differential work of a force is given by an exact differential okay uh, then we can write this expression work is equal to the change in potential energy negative of the change in potential energy or work from point 1 to point 2 is equal to simply the change in potential energy between point 1 and point 2 and one more important point forces for which the work can be calculated from a change in potential energy are conservative forces so this point is very important those forces for which we can calculate the work by simply calculating the change in potential energy are called conservative forces for example our gravitational force this is the conservative force and our spring force spring force is also a conservative force so spring force is also a conservative force now let us see the relationship between potential energy and equilibrium okay now suppose when the potential energy of a system is known then the principle of virtual work will be like this so as we all know that uh, for the application of principle of virtual work uh, change in work will be sorry uh, any work should be equal to zero and we can also write it as minus delta v because del u is minus delta v for the conservative forces and uh, we can write in this form also so minus dv by d theta delta theta so now for the in potential energy and equilibrium we have this expression okay and because this delta u is equal to zero so this thing should also be zero okay so dv by d theta should be zero okay so for the <coughs> potential energy and equilibrium we have change in potential energy with respect to theta should be zero now so suppose for this structure uh, we have potential energy total potential energy of this structure is elastic potential energy plus gravitational potential energy and now we know this elastic potential energy is half k x b square okay and this gravitational potential energy is w y c and uh, x b you can get the expression for x b and then you can simply put then you will get half k 2l sin theta square plus wl cos theta okay now for equilibrium what we do we differentiate this equation with respect to theta and put it equal to zero so finally we will get this equation l sin theta in bracket 4kl cos theta minus w is equal to zero okay so we will get two answers which shows that there are two positions of equilibrium for this body okay so i think this is clear